Dr. Guido Verbic. Thanks for coming in. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So you're a real smart guy. Uh, that's what they say. You know, I, I, I went to Auburn uh, when I first started school and majored in accounting. And uh, about two semesters in, uh, my uh, advisor advised that I should not be an accountant. So I guess that's what you're smart at. <laughs> You've developed like technology that can detect airborne viruses I or did. something crazy like that. That's right. Let's go into that. Let's just dive right in. Well, actually, you know, the viruses are kind of big and heavy. But so what our devices actually do is look for the chemical signatures that come off once the cells go, go apoptotic or they go cell death. So when a cell actually dies, um, there's a unique way that the cell will, enzymes will uh, kind of digest it. And when it does, you get these small molecule VOCs that come off and they can be recognized um, as viral markers, yeah. How'd you get into this? Yeah, so it's kind of crazy. We, we were talking with a group of guys about an infrared device, and somebody came up with, hey, you know, THC is becoming illegal in certain parts of the country, but there's no legal limit. So, I mean, we have blood alcohol that's done all the time, but we've never done anything with THC. So the conversation is, could we quantify THC on a person's breath? like you do with alcohol. And so that started us down the path to build the instrument. So we built an instrument essentially for THC and opioid detection. And um, then COVID hit. And so when COVID hit, of course, the conversation immediately goes to every room I'm in. Well, <laughs> can you do COVID? And uh, so we were like, well, we don't know. Well, we found a 2016 paper of a group that um, looked at some of the markers using l larger instruments. Um, and they found unique markers for flu, MERS, SARS-1. And um, so we mimicked that. We used the digestive cells of, uh, of COVID-19 and uh, identified the markers for those. And then we train our portable instruments to look for those markers. What are the use cases? So right now, the instrument, probably by the time you breathe into it to the time it gives you a good data, is about three minutes. Um, it's about 26 pounds in size, so it's pretty portable, it's pretty rugged, and it's pretty broad spectrum. So in those types of cases, you're talking about screening probably more than anything, more like maybe airport screening, um, athletes before they get out on the field, things like that. Um, stadium applications, we're trying to make it better, right? Because you can't, three minutes is not, that's too long. Right. Yeah. So your screening applications have to be in a certain window. Um, other ways like um, emergency rooms, of course, when people come in and they complain of a cough or, and a fever, well, you know, right now they assume everybody has COVID, <laughs> but, but in truth, you know, they could have any kind of illness. And so being able to distinguish would be powerful, powerful tool. And so are y'all live? Yes, there's a company called Inspect IR that we work with, um, and uh, they've, uh, they were the group that we talked about first um, that talked about the uh, infrared device, and that's how they got their name. And so they've adapted it and, and, and bought into the intellectual property, and um, so now we're trying to uh, get emergency use authorization from the FDA. Oh, so this does require an FDA approval? No, um, that's the crazy thing. So, you know, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of mimic it like it's, um, uh, you know, when you're in a court case and you have a bunch of eyewitnesses saying, "Oh, I saw that guy shoot that guy," and they're like, "Okay, well, where's the DNA evidence?" Well, you don't need DNA <laughs> evidence. So, the, the same sort of things happening with this device is that um, there's a lot of applications. Of course, the airport does not need to require it. Ports of entry don't need to require it, things like that. But it's just sort of, a, it's sort of a common language on everybody's mouth. Where's your FDA approval? And so it's sort of the thing that's needed in order to get you really up and running and started. So. That's so crazy because <laughs> the use case is like everybody. Right. Yeah, that's right. You can, I mean, you, you can imagine, even if we go back to the TC opioid thing, you can put that into uh, large warehouses where you have a lot of people on forklifts or driving trucks or doing stuff like that that need to be tested pretty regularly. I mean, people may even have legal, legal prescriptions, but they may just be impaired enough not to. So we know that uh, COVID testing is all across the board. <laughs> yes. And we, we also know that 
like, and you know this technology better than I, but apparently like when you test with the flu, it's like one in 10, 10 million is something you're searching for both with COVID. They do one in 40 million. So you got a lot more positive cases because they tested at a deeper level than they did with the flu. Um, and then we know that like some rapid testing is not correct. And like, I mean, like, uh, I know somebody that took like COVID, like three COVID tests and got two positives and one negative. And, but it started with like a negative and then he said he'd take it again and it was a like positive and the positive again. Uh, so it, what's the error rate on this? So that's an interesting uh, problem. I mean, the, our gold standard, as you said, if we're going to test our instrument against the gold standard, the gold standard has flaws. <laughs> so, so as an analytical chemist and a statistician myself, we have to think of other, you know, we have to think of other ways to really try to narrow down it. So, um, so, you know, initially when we're starting with these 200 cases, 200 people that we need to test it in for emergency use authorization, the idea is that you get people that are really truly symptomatic. They truly have the symptomatic um, markers for COVID specifically. And, um, and you kind of throw away the ones that are borderline and try to remove some of that, that 16% to 20%, 26% error um, that you're seeing in, on PCR tests and some of the antibody tests. So um, that's how we did it. We just, we had to throw away numbers in order to say, okay, um, we know that this person is more symptomatic and that's going to narrow ours. And, and people will ask us about the asymptomatic folks too. And I say, well, Let's talk about how viruses work. If you're asymptomatic, you're not coughing and sneezing on people. You're not, you're, you're not doing the things that is required for you to do to transmit the disease. So uh, um, let's worry about the symptomatic people. So. Yeah, they're, um, COVID has really exposed how dumb most people are. <laughs> exactly. It's just, well, it, it's how, how, how well people, how we, people are just used to being led around. And, and not seeking the, you know, everything that I quote when I talk to students and I talk to people about COVID, it's all peer-reviewed. Yeah. I give them only peer-reviewed answers that have already been done. <laughs> so it's weird. Yeah, there, there seems to be this, uh, you know, when COVID first hit, uh, there are people wearing gloves everywhere. Um, and then we found out it's an airborne virus. So that kind of went away. But I still see just massive amounts of hand sanitizer everywhere. And I... Maybe I'm wrong, but I just keep telling people, well, it's an airborne virus, so like, I don't think hand sanitizer is going to do anything to stop the spread. Yeah, the, um, there was a paper that actually came out in March, and, it, and it's the paper's on fomite. And so fomite is just our, you know, in science, we always have to come up with a very fancy technical term for surface, you know, because <laughs> we don't, we don't want to say the word surface, we're going to say fomite. So, um, but it came out on the fomite, and it, and it exposed that when people were doing the tests on transfer from uh, surfaces, um, that the load was four orders of magnitude greater than the viral load that could actually be excreted by a person who sneezed or coughed on it. And so those numbers were greatly exaggerated for the amount of time that a virus could potentially live outside the, um, outside the body and on a surface. And so, uh, so that, that came out in March, but it doesn't stop the narrative. Yeah. It hasn't stopped the narrative at all, so it's it's crazy. It's really, it's really strange, uh, and you just wonder, you know, like I'm not somebody who's like I've never really cared about misinformation because I've just always researched my own things. So when people always like that's a hot topic right now is misinformation. It's like, but uh, I got a Uber and it was in the winter, and she had the cold air blasting and all the windows down. And she said, uh, I was like, you know, is there any chance you could turn down like the AC? I would actually even like if you just put on a heater because it's cold out. And she's like, well, COVID doesn't do well in, in cold weather. And so with my windows down and having the AC on, I'm like preventing you and I, from, I'm keeping you and I safe. Nice. And I was like, uh, I don't know where you heard this. And I don't know the logic behind it. But if I'm just to make up things. I was always told to wash your hands with warm water. So I'm just going to make up things. I would think that maybe heat. <laughs> would do, <yeah. laughs> you know, I mean, we're just gonna, like, I'm not going to go that coldness stops it. Uh, so anyway, it's just been really interesting to see people's theories uh, on everything. And, um, uh, you know, it's very, it's very politi politicized now, which is unfortunate. I think we all saw that coming, uh, or at least most of us. So, 
how did you get into this? Okay, so you're an accounting major, and then they're like, you're too smart for this. So you go into chemistry, and then, I guess, take me through the progression of your career that leads to you creating machines that can detect viruses. Yeah, there's... Um yeah, when I went back from Auburn, I became a medic for a little while, and uh, and um, I really liked it. So I wanted to go to back to college to get my degree in biology, go to med school. But my first chemistry class, Dr. Letson, got me hooked and addicted. Um, and so my first advisor, major advisor, was an undergrad, and this is at Northeast Louisiana University, uh, University of Louisiana, Monroe now. And his name was Morgan Kidd. And so he put us, me on my first instrument. And when I got a taste of that, you know, solving problems, having the instrument look for solving new problems, I was addicted. So um, I started in spectroscopy there, which what is, that that's, the, um, that's using any kind of light source to determine if something's there. So the old spectrometers, you know, it, it, you, shoot a, you shoot a beam and, and whatever the chemistry is will interrupt the beam in a certain way and you can detect what that is. And it's not great. The resolution and stuff's not great, but it's good. Okay, so uh, I'm not near as smart as you, so I'm going to ask a lot of follow-up questions sure. here. Uh, when you <laughs> – you've seen the videos like the hotel room where it's like they like shine a certain light. Yeah, exactly. Is that the kind of – Yeah, that's a okay. type of spectroscopy. Okay. So they're looking for – yeah, you, you ne <laughs> never take a black light into a hotel room. That's right. Yeah, you won't sleep. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. The, so we, we started there um, – doing some chemical kinetics, which is measuring reactions of rates and ra rates of reactions for different compounds. And, um, and that was, you know, a lot of fun. And so, um, I went to work for a company which is now owned by Dow was Angus chemical company and, um, did analytical chemistry for them. And I liked that, but I wanted to go to grad school. So I went to UAB. I studied uh, protein detection with another type of instruments uh, called electrophoresis and so you separate proteins and you label them uh, with fluorescence and so we were building new multi-fluorescence monstrosities at UAB and I really enjoyed it and then I went to A&M and um, Texas A&M and did my uh, um, doctorate with David Russell in mass spectrometry and um, yeah that, that's pretty much the full gambit of analytical chemistry and uh, so we normally, I, when I started my career, um, I did my postdoc at um, Oak Ridge National Labs, and that was the first time we started to miniaturize these instruments, getting these instruments small enough for weapons inspectors and chemical weapon detection and these types of chemical immune building projects. And so um, when we really got down to miniaturization, I said, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to start seeking out problems and then see what we can do to build and figure it out so how does the ip on this work yeah that's uh that's interesting so um you know at the university at the uh, university of north texas is very generous with ip um so anything that's developed when you're in an academic world it truly belongs to the institution just like it does in the corporate world so if i have some intellectual property that i developed at a company the company owns it since i work for the company um so it's the same thing at unt but they're um they're generous with the royalties on it for the faculty members that come up with it. So if you really do come up with good IP, I have 16 patents now and um, probably another 10 applications that died somewhere in the process. But What are some of these patents? So um, I actually have, <laughs> I have an application now that's about to be converted on remote smell. So the ability to be able to add smell to the virtual reality or augmented reality experience. Um, that's one of my patents. So that's kind of a crazy <laughs> extreme, you know, uh, all the way down to um, uh, creating confined plasmas for um, cleaning surfaces, for instance. Um, so we, it's just a gambit. We've got the COVID one. We have some that um, are creating a chemical clock. So essentially, um, uh, you can put these in spaces where, um, you know, like the, um, <clears throat> the measuring seismic activity, you see those disks and, and the pin. Well, there's a pin and it draws a circle on the disk as a function of time. And anytime there's seismic activity, okay. it'll move. Well, we, tr we try to do that chemically. So we have a, what's called a Tesla clock and the clock will actually move and capture chemistry at any time of the day. And so you can look at the environment in your room at one o'clock at two o'clock at three o'clock or a hospital bed when you have somebody in there. 
Okay, so you have an idea. Uh, you and the university own it together, or they own it, but you are listed on it. Or maybe you're the patent holder, but they get some of the royalties. I don't know how it all works. And then the hardest part is, as you've learned, <laughs> is that ideas don't matter no matter how good they are. The ability to market them is kind of the the golden the golden goose. So do you go then to entrepreneurs or to existing companies and say like, hey, I have something you're going to like and then license it to them? Or do you try to sell it to them? Like how does the business of this work? Yeah, so the universities, it's a little bit different. Our tech transfer department is fantastic, actually. Um, and um, so I have a partner with helping seek entrepreneurs. So the university has, uh, most universities have a group um, and they'll find venture capitalists or that type of, you know, that are, and they'll pitch the, the patents that they have this year and, um, and, you know, essentially cast a net. But for me, I came from the corporate world. So this is, I came from, I'd had three stints in um, companies before I came to, um, excuse me. Yeah, I had three stints in companies before I came to the University of North Texas. And so I have, I speak that language better. In fact, NSF has never funded me. Uh, I get almost all of my money from corporate contracts, which is really how I started. So if I have an idea and I know a company may be interested, I'll just go to them and say, let's just do a pilot project. Let's say $100,000 would be enough for me to do six months worth of work on the project, give you and show you the data at the end of it, build you a prototype, um, and then you can make a decision. And I think for me, that's been the best way to work it because academia gives me a little bit of the flexibility that I don't have to start from ground zero. I have a lab. The university owns the intellectual property, like you said, and they're going to license it. So using the lab for those types of purposes for contract driven stuff is exactly what should be done. And, um, and then it, on the other side, it doesn't require that much of an investment from the company that's seeking it. Yeah. You know, they can, it, if you try to do this off, uh, off the ground, you have to build the infrastructure, you know, and it's, it's just too hard to do. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm going to give an example of how I do that, which is uh, far less cool or technical. But essentially, it's like I own a full service agency that does design development. Um, and so recently, I saw a gap that like Lemonade is great. It's this insurance app to get insurance, like the workflow. You can buy insurance in 30 seconds kind of thing. And I thought I wanted to insure my guns and there was no easy way to do it. Like all of them were very, you know, they looked like a gun dude made the website. Like it was a website from the nineties. Um, so it probably functions great, but looks terrible. So I called my friend who owns a gun shop and is also owns an insurance company and it's a private insurance company. I mean, of course they, a broker, but, and I was like, Hey, give us 50 grand. I'll build the app and the website for it. And, uh, we'll see how it goes. Like that's, it will cost us that to build it. We'll just split the cost on it. Um, and then, uh, if it's, once we launch it, we can then determine like who's going to run it. Like, you know, like let's just build this and then see what we want to do about it. We can license it and people can duplicate it and white label it. Like there's a bunch of things we can do, but let's just build this because I have the staff that can do it and you have all the insurance hookups. So that's my silly way of, uh, doing stuff like that. No, I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's a great way to do it. Um, and as you know, even our technology, you know, that's the sort of the conversations that we're having down the road is, you know, everybody wants to know, well, how do you app that? Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, you're great. You got this instrument, you got this guy over here, but you know, what I really want is all my information right here on this phone. Yeah. Um, do you follow Jordan Peterson at all? Yes. So have you heard him talk about like his, uh, job quizzes company? No. So, you know, before he was famous, he'd like had this idea that, uh, you know, essentially the person that interviews best is not the best hire. <laughs> That's just a person that interviews best. And he realized that companies, you know, will spend a lot of, if they, if they could not, they had to go through so many people to get to the right person. If they could prevent that, he would save them, you know, $20,000 a candidate. So he developed these, you know, this 300 question quiz or whatever, like he de developed some type of quiz system to say, hey, we'll screen employees and we can guarantee you like a 90% match that it's the perfect employee for the job. 
and he was so proud of himself and everybody in academia was so proud. And then he goes out there to sell it and nobody cares. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's crazy. And so that there's always that, you know, for, for me as an entrepreneur that didn't go to college, like I always, I just run from colleges or talk shit about them. Like that's kind of what I do. And I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs are probably that way. They do. I mean, you know, um, it, it's, it's always difficult for me. I'm a corporate guy in an academic world, which is an odd place to be um, for me. But, uh, you know, I, 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 seem, I think I seem to walk the line pretty well between the two because universities really want to engage corporations. I mean, look at Stanford. You know, their endowment's off the chart, and there's no way that they could accomplish any of that without the corporate, and especially from, from the uh, silicon industry. But so... They want it, but they don't speak the language. And so, um, you know, I think uh, that's where I can come in and sort of say, okay, I can, I can speak to your company, you know, and I can talk to any idea. But I can also talk to your academician who may have a good idea and try to stop him from being, you know, <laughs> destroying himself, right? Yeah. And, and um, because what a lot of academics like to do is sit and think. You know, that's what, and, and, and when I talk about a contract, you know, the first thing I have to do to convince the company is I'm not just going to take your money and sit over here and, you know, <laughs> hang out. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I'm going to hit deadlines. I'm going to have, you know, language in there. And so when, um, I was an associate dean for research for, uh, three years at, for the college of science at, uh, at university of North Texas. And part of the big thing was corporate engagement for me. And the, and the even bigger thing was saying, hey, look, you have a good idea as an academician. Now, let me help you connect you with the right people. But I need to also, um, you know, make you understand how contracts run. You know, like you've got deadlines you've got to make. You've got to communicate with them regularly, if not monthly, on how your progress is going. And you have to have go, no-go points, right, where you decide, well— I mean, what if this project will never work and take off the ground? Well, you know, NSF will fund you forever on that. But, but a company can't afford to do that. So <laughs> you've got to stop it. So, um, um, so it's fun for me in that part of it. I really like the corporate. So I'm now to Inspire Park, which is, a, which is um, sort of an area that UNT has set off for corporate engagement. So you can start companies there. You can bring companies in there. You can liaison there. You can do different stuff. They have all kinds of, um, uh, of offices and labs and different types of spaces that can be reconfigured um, if you want to try to spin off a company. And so uh, I think it's an exciting time. So for me, as somebody who loves starting businesses and investing in companies and stuff like that, and I see amazing stuff like this, and I'm like, cool, I'm the guy that can market it. I'm the guy that can get it out there, whatever the case is. Like, it's weird. Like Rabbit is a small kiosk that rents power Brits with the cords built in. And yeah. You can rent a return anywhere. And so it's like, cool. If we have a contract with the NFL for 40,000 units at every NFL stadium and we work with their security company to like, that's who we implement it with. Then like, and your goal was to get these COVID testing units at sports facilities. Like Rabbit is actually a great contact for you or other way around. We got crushed by COVID but we are, we already have the contacts and we're like, okay, cool. We could acquire them. And now we can go out there with this new product. Yeah. Uh, there's all these cool things you can do. How do I get alerted about stuff like this? Do I just start emailing every profile? <laughs> like what, what should be my, if I want to be like, always know about the latest things that somebody has developed and pitch me being their business partner in it. How do I make myself available to do that? Or where do I go to seek that? Yeah, there's two, two great ways. Um, you know, th these won't be shameless plugs because I have no <laughs> dog in the fight. But uh, one of them is Dallas Innovates. Dallas Innovates, the um, magazine itself, covers not only just the academic patents, but it also is tracking things like I didn't even realize that our patent was the fastest to be patented. Um, and uh, Dallas Innovates picked that up and wrote a story on it, didn't even know about it. So I picked up Dallas Innovates. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. How did I make the top 50? And I found out it was because I had the fastest patent to hit the market um, in Dallas. So um, that's a great way. The other way is to go to the tech transfer guys. They love 
entrepreneurial connections. Um, you know, at the University of North Texas, at UT Arlington, at UTD, all three of the schools are doing some great spinoff companies. I know, I know people at each one of them. And if you simply engage their tech transfer, they're going to put it in front of you. And as fast as possible. And can I do this at every university in the nation? Yep, yep. And you can create a portfolio. In fact, it's a brilliant idea. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think if anybody really does that. I mean, I know people hook up, you know, Texas A&M has a venture capital group, for instance, right? That, yeah. that works with Texas A&M. But has anybody created something that says, hey, I just want to I, I go to Google Patents. I'm going to do a search on every academic institution that owns a patent. And then I'm going to sort it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and pick and choose. I don't know. But I'm gonna uh, launch an app that does that. Okay, week. okay, good, good. <laughs> good. Just make Guido Verbeck come up first. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so crazy, man. I just, it's so, I have no, it's really something I know nothing about uh, in the sense of, because I never, I was homeschooled. So like, I literally know nothing about chemistry. <laughs> oh yeah. Like I was homeschooled and didn't go to college. So like chemistry is like straight Harry Potter to me. <laughs> That's right. It seems like make believe as a, I mean, as an adult, what can I do? Can I go like, how do I fit that? Like if I'm like, Hey, like this is interesting. I want to learn more. Do I just enroll in a class? <laughs> no, I mean, that would be horrible actually. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I tell my, um, I have a graduate class now and I tell them, you know, I spend my whole time teaching you that all the rules that you learned in general chemistry are broken. <laughs> no rules at all. And, uh, and teach you some other rules. So no, it would be a terrible thing to do. You know, a better thing to do is just to, I mean, I think just find a person that engaged enough that can communicate to, uh, you know, to a non-practicing chemist, but be able to give you the core. The, I mean, you, you need keywords. Entrepreneurs need keywords for knowing whether something will work. And so if I tell you, you know, I tell you markers, but in truth, those are ketones and aldehydes that break down from the lipid bilayer of the cell. See, I say that, and that's like, okay, my <laughs> eyes glazed over and I'm going to go to sleep now. But if I tell you that there are specific markers that COVID can produce when the cells die. Yeah. Right? Okay, everybody gets that. So, well, not everybody, but <laughs> you know, maybe not the sheeple of the world, but most people will get it. And, um, and uh, that's, I think that's just a simpler way, you know, where um, – for me, it was hard because I had to trust the marketing side, like you said, right? And you guys have a language. You know, I tried it at Auburn, and I told you I failed miserably at that. But um, so for me, a lot of times people are talking about cogs, you know, like, <laughs> what, what are your cogs on that? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And so when they slow down and they explain it to me, then now, now I know a little bit of their language enough to know, okay, these are the minimums that I have to come with. They need to know how many parts are already on the shelf so that I can make this instrument? What are the costs of goods sold? You know, um, but I don't care who they, you know, I don't care if it's the Dallas Cowboys or if it's uh, the Texas Rangers that they're going to sell it to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just need to know that when I pitch the idea, I'm like, okay, this is what it does. And this is the information you need. Yeah. And, and then um, I put some pretty icons and a nice font and take a cool photo. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And uh, yeah, because it's a two way street. Right. And I think, um, you know, also having space where academics and, 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 and entrepreneurs can come together and just teach each other their language uh, would be great. Yeah. My, one of my best friends is a guy named Eric Hansen who was uh, of our entrepreneurship for like, uh, University of Cal State, maybe, um, Cal State University. Um, and he ended up moving to Nashville and was an artist. And we met at like an entrepreneur event. And I think the first thing I ever said to him was, I hate college. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> and we just got to hit it off because, you know, uh, there is this, you know, he recognizes that like he didn't teach from a book. So he was like, I tried. But he recognized like the stuff we're teaching isn't helping real world entrepreneurs. And he goes, every time we bring in a real world entrepreneur, like it's everything they're saying to do isn't, you know, doesn't really lead to like, isn't what we're teaching. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk has this famous clip of him at Stanford uh, speaking to their entrepreneurship class. And he was like, I just want to start by saying I 100 percent believe if you're in this class, then you're not an entrepreneur. <laughs> 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 Everybody's like, 
<laughs> um, and because he's Gary Vaynerchuk, he can do that. But it was, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to see colleges kind of adapt to that. You know, like I thought that would be kind of the, like colleges would just give up. But colleges have been like, oh, okay, we'll release entrepreneurship programs and we'll like, we'll just become more flexible and we'll, well, you know, we'll try to break down what being an entrepreneur, like, you know, I've, I've watched colleges pretty adapt to that pretty well. Um, you know, higher education is a real, uh, a real interesting thing to me because they've been able to raise their price every year for 30 years straight. And then the government just bats the loan and then is accountable for the loan being paid back after. And so it's like, it's a pretty great field. Like if I wanted to start anything, I would try to start a university because it's, it's a pretty sweet deal that people get to, I can tell people whatever price the government <laughs> gives them a loan for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Even if it's a, 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 knitting a degree. private school. Yeah, or a, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or, or some degrees where you went off to school and it wasn't a, you weren't, didn't learn it. It was a competition with your classmates. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it was, you know? And so, yeah, it's weird on my side. I mean, I see it from the business side, um, even arts, you know, where a lot of kids are very, very talented in the art field. So they come and major in art, but wait, wait, you're, you're already talented. <laughs> go and major why in don't marketing. you spend, yeah, why don't you go spend four years, uh, you know, painting or, you know, you, you're certainly going to be more famous, but, um, but in chemistry, it's very different, right? I mean, chemistry is just not it's one of those one of things where it's required. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and chemist, luckily the physical laws, unlike entrepreneurship and economy, I mean, economy, I guess could be in some way, but in chemistry, we're stuck with physical laws, right? And so we just have to, tra once we transfer these physical laws over to the next human being, then, you know, I'll f figure out what you want to do with So this. let's dive deep into, you have a patent on smell for virtual reality. Yes. How do you bottle smell or how do you bottle, like, is it? Is it a perfume that just spray? <laughs> no, it's a, this. so nowadays part of the idea was um, Fios, believe it or not, Verizon's Fios system was the one that brought it in. Fios drove the price of photodiodes so low, laser photodiodes, because they send the signal from the fiber optic that um, I can use those as localized heaters. So wherever I shoot that photodiode, depending on the frequency. What's a photodiode? So the photodiode is, um, it's essentially a small laser. It's a light emitting diode and they have certain frequencies. So I think it's 910, 1130, maybe 1200, 1300 nanometer range. So these are different frequencies of light that these photodiodes send out and they send them out in, in a certain order and that's how the signal is prime because light is the fastest travel, right? So, um, so when these little tiny photodiodes, and they're about two millimeters across, and there it can be targeted on a specific target and cause the thing to heat locally and expand. So that's what the, the little okay. photodiode will do. So what I do is I take a material like Teflon. I tune it to the photodiode that'll cause that Teflon to expand locally. And then I impregnate little tiny pieces of Teflon with pine. You know, burning fire. These terpenes, we call the the chemical of these aromatic terpenes that you can make, like banana smell and all these smells that you know that we all like. And so I can impregnate them on these little tiny pills of Teflon all along, and I have all these photodiodes. And now it's computer controlled. I can shoot the photodiode more often or at higher intensity to create a stronger smell or a weaker smell. So now it's all computer controlled. So as I'm walking through a forest, for instance, and I'm going into the woods and I'm approaching a fire, I can increase the pine, decrease the pine, start the fire coming in. And you're controlling this with light? Yes. Inside the VR? Inside, or? yeah. There'll be, it's, it, it's probably right now, if, if I wanted about 100 smells, I could probably do it all in the size of the, the top end of this mic. So like, um, I guess I have Three to touch yeah, three inches. So, and that goes in the. V does it have a one-time use? Does it like? Does it? Are you able to shoot it ever and ever again? Yeah, the same yeah, way? you can. It, um, the smells will be in there for a while, but you you'll need to change cartridges and maybe game in. Oh, so it's like a cartridge that you put in for the smells, right? Or maybe you know, like <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. But let's say we take Halo, for instance. We'll take the Halo game. I mean. 
they may have, you know, you open up the game cartridge and then there's this own remote smell cartridge sitting in there for the Halo game um, or for, you know, Assassin's Creed or for whatever it is that you like. So part of it, the part of the reason that I wanted to do remote smell was because one of the main senses Department of Defense, when you're training soldiers for VR, for engagement, urban engagement or whatever they need, the sense of smell is powerful. I mean, let me tell you, if if I'm about to approach a corner and I smell burning flesh, I smell munitions, I, you know, I can make a decision, right? With my nose, I don't, I don't have to look behind, around the corner. Yeah. But we don't train them that way. So when we first came up with the idea, it was like, how could we help the warfighter add more of an immersion experience so that he could really, you know, we could give him different smells like munitions and train him on different things um, before he goes over there. Um, that would be just a wealth of, of knowledge. Now, so you have like the VR headset and there would be just some lights that fire off. Yeah, it would be enclosed. Yeah, right. so the whole cartridge would 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 be encapsulated into a giant. It looks it looks like a giant pill, you know, and um, and so that might sit here or sit up here in a headset, um, but but then would have to be forced, you know, into the nose. And and you know, we we even have these conversations like you got four buddies in the room and you're all playing what Fortnite, right? But you're not all in the same place. So my smells can't interfere with the guy's smell across, you know, the table from me. So it has to be localized, which is great, which means we just need a really small amount of the chemistry. If we're putting it right in the nose, it's, you don't need, you, no one else in the room is going to smell it. Who produces this? Like who produces the cartridge? Nobody. This is. Like who could or, produce it, I'm saying. Oh, um, I, anybody. I mean, I guess you could get, um. It's going to be easily mass produced. Is yes. Like, okay. Yeah, the photodiodes are off the shelf. We've tuned them to a couple of surfaces, the ones that Verizon Files use. So we've done those experiments. So it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, my mind's officially blown. Um, so uh, if we look at Nikola Tesla, he apparently could transfer light wirelessly and was the only person to be able to do that. And we still don't know how he did that. Uh, is that still the case? Um, well, I mean, we can transfer, we can't, no. Yeah. So, I mean, you can do it from one point to another, as long as there's, um, there's a lot of things that have to be in. So one, the atmosphere can't absorb it. So light, um, can be absorbed by chemicals in the atmosphere. So you could have different environments. For instance, you could go into one of the most polluted cities in the world, and you go to one of the most pristine areas and light won't travel the same way because of all the chemistry that's in the atmosphere. So you just won't be able to shoot the light. So you have to pick a frequency that can go through the muck, essentially. And then you have to have line of sight. I mean, the, the two things have to be facing each other. So we can do that. Um, but can't shoot light around the corners. Is or there stuff that Nikola has done that we do, just still don't know how he did it? Well, I th and I mean, wirelessly turn on a, a light bulb was like his thing. Apparently, he could shoot electricity, like this is you know. Oh right, from one light bulb yeah. to another. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if he could do it. If it was a trick, that's a good question. There are a lot of things that have reported that he's done. Um, like you know, he stopped his work on the death ray to blow up the Earth from the core out. So I'm glad he stopped that work. <laughs> that, that experiment would have been a one time experiment, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to, there's so many, you know, people say like the FBI raided his, his like house after he died and like took everything. Uh, but again, if a guy is, has developed machines that are this big that can take down an entire bridge, that's probably a good thing. Like, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Well, it's uh, called, yeah, it's the noble, I call it the noble effect, right? Or <laughs> Nobel effect is, you know, you, you make something for good, people are going to find an evil use for it. Um, but you, you try to be philanthropic about it, you know, and say, oh. Well. So uh, I know he developed a thing that could, like, take down a bridge that was, like, a small machine. And I had a structural engineer explain to me is that, like, a bridge has a frequency. And essentially, it's his machine could it'd be about finding the, the frequency, and then eventually it will just crack. Yeah, they say that um, if you can find the perfect frequency, like, even with a hammer, and you hit on it, then it, it the – the waveform will start to propagate and, and uh, can be destructive. 
So I, I think people have done that. I don't know to what extent. Um, certainly the military is not sharing that <laughs> technology with me. I wish they would. That would yeah. So how did you get into working with uh, – you worked with – Department of Justice? I did. I worked yeah. with... Um, <laughs> How did you get in with that? <laughs> that is a crazy story. So it starts with um, it starts with this project. So I, I tell the students always, don't say no to anybody, even if it's outside your area. So the Biometric and Forensic Summit, which was at Fort Huachuca um, um, base, and um, which is near Tombstone essentially. And um, we went out there and we were giving this talk on this, on the portable instruments to these um, uh, war fighters and other people that are doing biometrics. And so I said, why do I belong here? This biometrics is like, you know, uh, fingerprints and measuring the blood vessels in your eyes and stuff like that. So I gave this talk. Yeah. Boring stuff. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I gave this talk and this war fighter stood up in the back of the room and he said, um, would it be interesting if you could detect the chemistry of whatever the the bomb was that the person was making, if we if we found an IED, you know, if we found an IED detonation board, is it possible to know what chemistry that person had touched? Well, we had developed an instrument that would work that way. Sure enough, I went in. I wrote. Um, um, there was a proposal that came out as a White House initiative um, with um, with USACIL, the U.S. Criminal Investigation Laboratory, and. Uh, it got funded. I just told them how I'd do it, and so that's what we did. We did that project for two years, um, and we were able to come up with new ways of detecting explosives on devices, very small amounts. So I can essentially, if if you have a fingerprint left behind on there, I can go into the ridges of the fingerprint and extract the chemistry out of the ridges and see what you've touched. And, yeah. Okay. My very first thought when you said that was Elizabeth Holmes. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Theranos. <laughs> yeah. Like, no way is that true. <laughs> yeah. Like, like her stuff seems, you know, like her stuff obviously was BS, right? It was her oh, yeah, whole right. thing was you could have this much blood and do a hundred and something test. Right. And I remember thinking like, that doesn't, I don't know how anybody fell for that. Well, we, then when you see this stuff that's actually real and does exist, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. We, um, we, um, we had an interesting debate when it came to building a device like this because if I use the bathroom in the airport, I probably have cocaine on my hands. I mean, you know, if, <laughs> if you're going to do cocaine in an airport, that's probably where you're going to do it. So if, if I can pick out, you know, like an atogram of material out of your fingerprint, what does that mean? Um, so we looked at other kind of bigger uses like assault. Like, so if, 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 if I slap somebody, then their chemistry, makeup, whatever it is it was, is now my fingerprint. And so if I touch it, my fingerprint is chemically them. And um, so uh, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do with it where you, you're not overly intrusive because you have too much sensitivity. The last thing I want to do is tell somebody, hey, well, you got, you know, you're a cokehead because you got an atogram of cocaine on you. Okay, so at the airport... Um when you get randomly selected and they get a swab and they run it down everything and they put it in this little bots, you're the guy that develops the bots, right? Right. And that, that I'm my, um, I worked my graduate thesis, my doctoral thesis was on the technology that's in that box. I didn't work on that box itself. Um, uh, Smith and, and, um, uh, Cygen and all those guys were the ones that have developed those, um, those devices. They're called ion mobility devices and they, um, they use a, um, a corona discharge to look for explosives or munition type stuff because they're highly electronegative. So they, so they swab you all over your camera lens, all that stuff, right? And then they stick it in the instrument and it gives you a 50% fail or something worse than that. It's pretty bad. I think it's more like uh, to make people sweat. Yeah. <laughs> so doesn't actually work? It does work. It does work. It's just I'm a mass spectrometrist, so I have to make fun of the ion mobility folks. I mean, mass spectrometry would do a better job. It's just not as we can't make it as portable yet. We're getting there. Um so the ion mobility and the mass spec guy's always been at war. Luckily I've I've done my thesis on both. And um and so I can kind of speak the language on both sides. So I give them a hard time. But that it's the right technology for the time. 
Okay. Now it's time to move it forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's going to replace it? Yeah, Mass Spec will replace okay. it. Yeah, and there's probably 20 groups across the country that are working on the technology for that, but you'll see mass spec in the TSA. So on your, on your COVID thing, uh, do people blow into a bag that then is put into a machine? How does that work? No. Yeah. That one was one of the most interesting things because we had to really design a way where we couldn't cross contaminate a person. So we ended up coming up with the heated inlet. So the inlet's hot. Cause like you said, if I want to kill a virus, I don't want to use cold. Why don't I want to use cold? Cause it's just going to keep the virus surviving longer. So I'm going to heat it up and kill it. So we had a heated inlet on the front of it, but we used a straw, and the straw is just disposable. So you'd red bag the straw like you would, you know, when you're doing a, you know, blood stick or whatever, um, and then and then you have the front of the instrument so it doesn't cross contaminate the next person in line. Um, but so you take straw, I put it in, I blow for ten seconds. Yeah, you just need I don't one drink, breath. So nerve down to breath wise. No, no, no. <laughs> um, you just. Um, the only reason I know is not because I've used a <laughs> breathalyzer, but because I've done the instrument. Um, when you blow, it's just one complete breath. So you just take a deep breath. And one of the reasons why you want to take a deep breath, you really want to get those, that chemistry off of the cell. Okay. And then you just blow it, the whole thing out. And it's got, a, um, it's got a substrate that captures the specific chemistry that we're interested in. In this case, those markers. And then, then, it, then after that, it closes it off. It heats that up puts it in the gas phase, puts it in the instrument, instrument tells you yes or no. Cool. I mean, it's better than them stuffing a uh, yes. stupid, cute thing up your nose. That is the worst. Yes. I t- <laughs> Luckily, I've only done it once. And, um, yeah, and I did it because I wanted to feel the pain of not – you know, creating an instrument that won't do that, right? And so I can go tell people, hey, this is a lot better. Um, how long does it take to make your instrument? How much does it cost? So, you know, roughly, I think the price points on these instruments are going to be something around 50K. Okay. So, um, you know, initially people had talked about, when we talked about the drug stuff, go, oh, we can have one of these in every cop car. Yeah, it's cost the <laughs> price of the cop car. So, um, but, but... If you're if you're guarding a gate or an entry, then you could do this as a rent or a um, or a um, or a, a it, institution could buy one. Yeah, what's the what makes it cost fifty grand? The time to assemble it or the all the patents and stuff that people have to get paid out on? Yeah, so I made a mistake early in my career when I was making portable instruments. Um, is I would design them in my lab. And I'd build them and I'd say, hey, look, this worked. And people go, oh, that's great. Now, where do I get all these components? Well, my lab, right? <laughs> and, um, so, and I'm not a production facility. So when we started down the path with this instrument, we decided, you know, we need things that are off the shelf. What can I get that there's a lot? So semiconductor industry has a mass spec that's called a residual gas analyzer. And they've been using RGAs for decades. And there are four major companies that make these. So they're on the shelf. Um, and, uh, so there's vacuum components. Those are, there's five companies that make those. So what I did was just make, take as many off the shelf components I can and assemble an instrument with that. And, um, so the price comes from essentially that. Okay. Um, so it, it takes me a couple of days to put an instrument together. So if you were vertically integrated, does the cost go down? Now there's your marketing word. Okay, so so that uh, means that you own the supply chain, so you make every piece of it. Yeah, if I it, that's where you want to be. Okay. So at the first part, um, you're you, you're at the whim of these other companies. That's your other. That's the other problem, right? So and not only that, now I'm in a fight against semiconductor, right, <laughs> for these components. And once they find out that I'm buying them all up, they're going to they're going to do something. So, um, yes. So the idea is that maybe you have a one year, two year window where you can do this off the shelf and you need to start producing your own. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Because with, with rabbit, uh, we hired a dude in China that took apart our unit and sourced every single prop like part. And then I just went to him and I was like, all right, here's your cost on everything. Here's the margin. I'm okay with you making. And they were like, uh, what? <laughs> and, uh, it's funny. There's a guy who I thought was a friend and then has just the second I like stopped paying him, like just never talked to me again. Didn't come to my wedding. And it was just like 
congratulations on our baby. Just like super odd. But he's the one who actually gave me that idea for that. So like I hate him, but like at the same time, like it was a really great idea. idea. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It's, um, and I think also the other thing is these companies, there are these companies that make these devices. They're looking for the next thing, right? Because your stockholders don't want you to be stagnant. Look, you've been making the same $10 billion every year. It's time to crack (laughs) that up a little bit, you know? And um, so they're always looking for something. How can we increase labor? How can we increase, you know, production? And so the fact that you have four companies, you can't pit them against each other, you know, like say, okay, this market requires this, go. And um, um, and see what comes out. Yeah, it's it's really interesting with, with COVID because, um, you know, right now we're firing millions of nurses who aren't vaccinated, which is a, I can't Are you just, talking about the nurses that were working when we didn't have a vaccine? You mean those nurses? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So it's just a ridic- It's just so ridiculous. And in Oregon, they're removing your license too. You get fired, and your license gets removed, uh, <laughs> which is sounds like something I would hear that North Korea is doing. Like truthfully, um, and so we we have this like that that sends the message that we really care about vaccination which in my opinion would send the message that we really care about COVID. But my friend who is the CEO of a healthcare company, he said, well, we require everybody to get tested every single day because vaccinated people can get it and spread it. So we don't care if you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated. We think that's your own decision to make, but we do care about if our patients are exposed to COVID, which is why we test everybody every single day. And so uh, I look at your option, you know, so maybe, I mean, again, this is just such a mind blowing thing of like, that's so away from the science and so away from the issue at hand. Is there anything you think I'm missing? (laughs) No, that's exactly right. Um, You know, I've, I've chose the testing option also because, you know, like you said, I read the Mayo Clinic report um, and this was right before uh, FDA approval came out. And, um, so I don't understand the Mayo report was already in hand. And, um, at that point, I think we were at, you know, a success rate of 40%. But if you look at Israel and England and some of their statistics and cause they are a more monitoring society and closed systems, um, the numbers are even worse. And so you're absolutely right. Who became the super spreaders? Well, I'm, if I'm unvaccinated and I'm getting tested, I know I don't have it. But if the vaccinated people are exempt from the test, <laughs> then they become the super spreader. And uh, it's, it's hard when I say this that it's like, well, that's just common sense. This doesn't take a yeah, lot of int- I'm just like so – I literally when I like play this out of my head, I'm just like, what? What is – like the fact that we're requiring people to force their employees into a vaccine um, is, re- is ridiculous because we live in the United States of America. But despite all of that – if the vaccine, if people can still get in, like, it just seems like the solution is testing. It seems like that is the ultimate solution to beating this. It is. And, um, and, and we need to kind of, you know, part of the uh, problem when the COVID came out is that we closed everything down that, and that included the things that could have helped us solve the problem with COVID, you know, like my lab or like, you know, <laughs> so there, there are people that are smarter than I am out there that can solve this problem. And we, we tied their hands for a while, you know, now they're loosed a bit, but, um, but you're right. I mean, testing is the way, and it's for all of it, because if what I'm telling you about the cell lines is if something new comes up, we'll see it. Um, so if we can see the flu and we can see MERS and we can see SARS or people can develop tests for this, those papers were written in 2016, then, um, then why not have it? If COVID dies tomorrow, um, you know, the, our normal, you know, our normal, what, what I want to call our 9-11 mentality is to forget about it right after a couple of years. And then we move on with our lives when we should be remembering these things. And so COVID should be a, a long reminder for us. It's not COVID. It's the Spanish flu or something yeah. that's going to kill us. So let's now use COVID as a, to make these non-invasive devices. Um, 
Keyword a non-evasive. <laughs> Keyword very non-evasive. Stop scraping my brain. Yeah, and uh, that's right. That's so crazy. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting uh, to see this this fight to keep it going in a way. Um, like you look at when Joe Rogan got uh, COVID and he was like, oh, I'm taking ivermectin, and like everybody's running a story that he's taking horse to warmer. He's like, right. yeah, I didn't go to a vet. I went to a doctor and I got like a prescription <laughs> for right. it. Like this is ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, then, and broad spectrum antibiotics and these types of what people, what people fail to realize is they say, well, that's not effective against COVID. Okay. But it's effective against pneumonia and it's effective <laughs> against, you know, keeping the microbacteria out of your body that you have now become immune compromised because of COVID. So it's the way they spin it, right? Yeah. Oh, it drives me insane. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that you, as a PhD doctor, like, you just probably just focus on the fats and data. Yeah. And so people will, if you come out against somebody's narrative, they're like, oh, he's political, or he voted for Trump, or like all these oh, things, yeah, right. you're like, I literally am just giving yeah. the case study. <laughs> yeah, I only quote students and everybody. I said, look, if, if I say something and you guys think that I'm wrong or something like this, ask me. Because I'm, I'm using the peer-reviewed literature. This is, this is data that's coming out of Oxford. This data is coming out of Mayo. This data coming out of the CAC, CDC, even. Um, and um, and I'm giving you these peer-reviewed people accepting this data, um, and uh, and it still doesn't matter. It messes with the narrative. It, it messes with somebody's op-ed piece. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm an analytical chemist. I have no time for op-eds. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so. My, uh, I've just, it's, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting to see how this plays out, you know, cause I, I just never thought it would get to this point. And now I'm like, well, what's next? I mean, the nurse thing is really one that's just mind blowing to me. Cause we already have a really, a big nurse shortage right now. They're paying them. I had heard from a friend of mine, almost, some of them are $200 an hour because they can't find nurses to do it. And now they got to find nurses that'll be vaccinated when they were practicing unvaccinated at the worst of it. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I really feel bad for the healthcare workers. I mean, God bless them. They're the, you know, they're the reason that uh, we made it through this crisis early, early, you know, and um, man, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, Cause I don't know what getting, like my understanding is I just don't know what everybody getting vaccinated does. Like if everybody tomorrow is vaccinated, what does it doesn't stop COVID doesn't stop from spreading doesn't so I don't understand why that's the end goal no and in the end what happens is you know I I, I tell everybody I tell my students um, we had a hygiene issue you know Paul Harvey if you ever listened to Paul Harvey growing up he always wanted people to touch elbows right he hated shaking hands it was just like that was the worst thing in the world for him <laughs> and um so it was kind of funny, but I said, you know, we had this opportunity very early to teach hygiene, which is what we should have done, right? That's just, um, you know, you should wash your hands when you come out of the bathroom, you know, and things like this, you know, just to keep things from spreading. But we missed that opportunity, and um, we we put a lot of people in, you know, um, suicide rates have gone up. You know, there's a lot of depression now because we isolated people, and, and we're very social creatures, right? And so... Um, um, yeah, yeah. I wish we could go back and, and hit restart. So what made me suspicious from day one is when people were like, I think this came from a lab and then their posts were removed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then it just continues to get more and more suspicious. And like, for me, I've had COVID twice. Um, so I would like to think that my natural immunity is pretty damn good at this point. <laughs> yeah. And that's not being considered at all. And no matter what, you know, like out of Israel, there's a peer reviewed study that's like, Hey, you're 20, like you're uh, like 27 times more or less likely to get COVID if you have natural immunity or something like that. Yeah. There was a, there was a paper that came out where they decided to go back. I think this paper was released in May and the researchers decided to go back and test blood samples that we stored uh, and went back to 2009 and um, studied the immunity for COVID-19 in 2009. And they found that some countries had up to 50% immunity already to COVID-19 in 2009, which means that it was another coronavirus that caused the antibodies to be produced at that time, which could be, 
I don't know, SARS-1 or yeah. one of them. So, um, you know, there's a, yeah, where, I don't hear anybody talking about that and talking about the built-up immunity. I mean, when I was a kid, I'm not suggesting this at all to your listeners um, <laughs> before I say this, but when we had chicken pox, we were forced to go play with the kid, yeah. right? And, um, you know, my daughter just, it went through her whole college. And it, since they just let it through. You know, there was not much anything else to do. They certainly don't want to. This was kind of funny. So at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, I thought that nobody had watched the movie Outbreak or played the game Plague Inc. Because if you did, you did exactly, you dispersed the disease exactly the way you're <laughs> supposed to. Instead of containing it, you said, oh my gosh, we've got all these kids with COVID on this college campus. Let's send them home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let me explain Outbreak to you. Well, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's crazy. So here's something interesting, and I don't know if it's peer reviewed, and so, but apparently, and I and I don't know if the country's right. It might be Norway or Switzerland, but one of those countries banned mask recently, and they have a forty percent decrease in COVID since banning mask. And so my first, when I just read that and thinking, how is this possible? Was that okay? When people aren't wearing mask, they're now exposed to things, which builds their uh, immune system. And now they don't have a weak immune system when they come in contact with COVID or flu or anything, they have a better chance of not getting it. Yeah. The, um, the other point that's, that, that is right. Um, the other one is that your, your body expels all the bad things. I mean, the, uh, the expelling it out of the lungs is one mechanism urinating and defecating it, but then also breathing out is one way that your body gets rid of bad stuff and so if you're wearing a mask and you're constantly exposed to the bad microbacteria you're not cleaning it you're not why we know that i mean look at everybody i mean we're not <laughs> there you know i i pull the one out of the back of my truck when i'm required to and it's probably <laughs> brown in there but um the microbacteria and stuff that's in the mask that you're constantly exposing yourself to doesn't help your body fight things um which may be another reason um and there are some studies on masks and microbacteria and so those go back way back when we started to require those for hospital use but clearly in the hospital the outside is worse than the inside um you hope you you, you were healthy when you were working but yeah well it's you know uh the reason this got political is because we did political things so right. in march <laughs> we changed the way uh, birth certificates are like we rewrote birth certificates to where instead of saying, what'd you die of? And then underlying causes, there was a, did you die of COVID? Did they die of COVID? Yes or no. <laughs> and so we just like messed up all the data from day. And that's like, that's a political move. Like that is like, you know, and then the death toll on the TV at all times. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I tried to go back and look at things like flu rates and that type of stuff that's going on now. And so I asked my nurse practitioner across the street, this is anecdotal, so I'm, I don't, this isn't peer reviewed, so I'll just say it out loud. But I, I asked her, what are you doing at your hospital? And um, she said, well, we're testing people for COVID. And I said, well, flu season's hitting. What about flu? No, we can tell they have the flu. So, but it's not that the nurses aren't doing their job. They are, they can tell the difference between a person who has a flu and a COVID because they're exposed to it every day. But it's the data. Like you said, everybody in the hospital is COVID, no COVID. Well, so according to the CDC, there was no flu season. Like, you know, there was no flu last year. And it's, they say because of the precautions we took for COVID. And I'm like, okay, nobody followed the precautions. <laughs> so, uh, either some people had the flu and they were marked as COVID. Like this is just like, that's the thing is like, they're like, okay, nobody follows the precautions and that's why we're here. Right. But then at the same time they go, the reason we had no flu last year and you look it up, you can Google CDC flu results, 2020, and it will show there was no flu cases. <laughs> Which to me tells me that's great because we, we shouldn't have very many this year, right? <laughs> because nobody there to spread it. Right. Yeah. And to spread it around the world. But that's not going to happen. When COVID goes away, our flu numbers will be back <laughs> to where they were. You know. Yeah. So it's just all such a, a cluster mm -hmm. that I can't believe still exists. Because, you know, for me, I remember, uh, you know, we manufacture in China. So I, re I remember it sweeping through. I remember my CTO who's uh, just on Reddit a lot. Being like, hey guys, there's this this like 
there, there was 18 million phone subscriptions canceled in China last month. And he said this in like, uh, like February. And uh, one of my employees wrote, stop watching so much Fox News. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, like, you know, so it's just like, uh, and, you know, that's why, like, you know, and I always said, like, I think we needed a lockdown because we thought it was way worse. We thought China was lying about the numbers because there was stuff like that coming out, that 18 million subscriptions were canceled that month. Uh, that made you think that, oh, wow, this could be, like, really, really bad. Like, death rates could be, like, five percentile. Um, like, COVID's biggest blessing to me, what I always told people, is that, like, it didn't kill young, healthy people very often. Uh, whereas if you look at, like, the Spanish flu, that somebody would be, like, 20 years old and just get it and instantly die. Not right. instantly, but, like, you know, completely healthy and die. Right, and that was, um, you know, a lot of people think um, that was a beaut built up immunity from something that had occurred, I think it was 30 years or 40 years prior to that, where that generation was exposed to a type of flu of that type, and they had a built up immunity, but the young hadn't, hadn't, hadn't been exposed to it, and, um, and they died to it. That's tragic. I mean, that is tragic, right? That's protective. Um, there's a Star Trek episode I compare this to, where all the kids on the planet are still alive, and all the parents and everybody are dead. It was the same situation, right? There, the immunity of the of the kids out being yeah apparently uh george bush was reading a book like discovered that like every hundred years a health pandemic breaks out and in the 2000s like built like a huge like stockpile of everything and like <laughs> apparently was like paranoid this was going to happen again soon and then the swine flu happened uh, you know, five years or so after he'd built up all this and they depleted it all and then neither Obama or Trump replenished it. Right. Um, uh, yeah, that's something that, like I said, we have these short-term memories. <laughs> and um, um, so when we, when we set out to build a COVID box, I didn't want to build a COVID box because I was thinking SARS-1 or MERS, these things have very, very short-lived you know, they died out in nine months. We didn't see anything else from them. Um, and I felt the same way about um, COVID, SARS-2. And um, so I said, if we're going to go down this path, when we're done getting emergency use authorization and all of this stuff, it's all gone. <laughs> so we need to have this box ready for any respiratory illness, right? Um, so uh, that's what we had in mind, and we focused on it because uh, the flu, I do think the flu will kill us, right? I mean, if we're going to have... Um, some sort of pestilence that's going to wipe us out. It's going to be something like the Spanish flu now. Now that we know microbacteria a little bit better, it could do it. But I, I feel like there's going to be a flu. Talk to me about bioweapons. Bioweapons are... Uh, so there are, there's... Th one of the biggest problems with bioweapons and the detection of bioweapons is the, that they're... It's classless. It's, it's kind of like explosives. Explosives have two classes. We call them organic molecules and inorganic molecules so it, make, it makes it hard to make a detector that's built for one to detect the other <clears throat> for um for bioweapons that's it's a huge it's giant we've got ricin which is a toxin um we've got anthrax and then we got we got viruses so we got microbacteria we got viruses and we have um um toxins so any of those can be weapons bio um what most people focus on is how you disperse them you know so looking at how you know if you're going to disperse a biological weapon how would you do that and could you detect that mechanism as opposed to the weapon itself because yeah i mean an air particle just flying through the air uh, of a certain size could be anything um, so you can make it a virus. They make chimera viruses. So chimera viruses are sort of the idea that you take one virus as the, as the mechanism for dispersion and another virus as the kill, right? Um, uh, these are all been banned, of course, but, um, uh, but that's in our history. So, um, the, it's really hard to build a device to say, I want to develop, you know, Department of Defense always wants me to build a device that's good <laughs> for bioweapons, but it's so it's classless. It's it covers such a huge amount of chemistry and biology um, that it's really hard. It's a difficult task, not impossible. So, I'm really confused about bioweapons because my understanding is that 
uh, Russia could just launch a nuclear bomb. And then if they did that, we would launch a nuclear bomb. <laughs> and before you know it, the whole earth has been destroyed essentially with nuclear weapons. And so that's what happens if we decide to launch nuclear bombs at each other is that nobody exists anymore. Right. So if I'm a country and I want to release a bioweapon. <laughs> yeah. You better be able to confine it to a group of people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or have a way to kill it. Yeah. Right. Beforehand. And so you don't want to create a virus you can't kill. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> There's um, part of sort of the ethics of doing scientific research in my lab um, is this idea that um, there, any, in, any experiment um, requires biosafety level, level readiness three or four if you can build something that has no antidote to it, right? And so you have to have strict you know like remember the movie the rock confinement mechanisms suits and rebreathers and everything um because some experiments that you do some experiments that researchers will do is try to create something and then they need to create the antidote to it right because that's what they want so let's say i create small a form so of small box yeah if you worked at a lab in, let's say, China, and you did gain a French function research, <laughs> yeah, you had some kind of play. yeah, right. Yeah, we want to see what if could happen if uh, that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's an actual two Y three Y example in the NIH manual that talks about examples of of um, of a form of TB that. Um, a researcher had gotten on themselves and they exposed a two-year-old or a three-year-old um, to it. And um, so NIH has a lot of examples of exactly what you're saying, right? Where a researcher goes in to do something uh, and they bring it out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's bad. Very, very bad. Yeah. You need, <laughs> you need to create the antidote, you know? So... Is it, the po is it possible to detect a virus with cameras uh, or light? Or like, you know, so I'm thinking about like, okay, if a, if a virus, like if, if I can shine a black light and see nasty things in a hotel room, is that somewhat possible uh, just in general around among viruses? And it might take a microscope to be able to see it or whatever the case is, but is that a thing? Yeah, so... There's an area in science called immunoassay. And so essentially what they do is they make a puzzle piece and they put it on a substrate and that puzzle, that virus fits the puzzle piece exactly. It's how they do antigen test on you. Um, so it may be possible to disperse something like that with a tagant, like um, a fluorophore, some, uh, something that will, like when you shut off the lights and you put the black light on, there will shine on. And so you may be able to disperse an element like that and detect it um, in that way to see if, you know, there's a viral load in the air. I don't – the question would be – they tell me that when you sneeze, your viral load's like 100, okay? Of course, the test that we were talking about on the fomite was a million. So that's a considerable <laughs> difference. But, um, but 100 would be a small amount. So even if you had a sick person in there, a couple of sick people in there, you don't have a lot of virus in the air, but you don't need a lot, right? I only need one to start to hijack a cell and start doing its job. So sensitivity is going to be an issue, but it's it's probable. How's that? So uh, we are trying to find a pediatrician. And uh, kind of my litmus test is just to ask their thoughts on the hepatitis B vaccine. Um, because about f like – Three kids die a year, hepatitis B. Uh, they've never had a case where a kid, uh, like, uh, had hepatitis B, cut himself, and then somebody else, or somebody had it, cut themselves, got on the kid, and the kid got it. Um, so it seems to not be spread that way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not anti-vaccine in any way, shape, or form, but that one vaccine is just kind of one that seems silly. It's like, why, like, uh, if, you know, my wife and I, uh, live in a nice house and we're healthy and we don't have an open marriage and like these things where you get like, she doesn't have hepatitis. I don't have it. Like 
to vaccinate a little kid doesn't, you know, or a five week old doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We're talking about spacing out vaccines and she goes, well, I don't want to space out vaccines because, you know, uh, let's say there's sick babies in. That means if you're, that means you're coming in more often. If you're spacing out your vaccines, it was just like some BS excuse. She's like, so if you're coming in more often, there's a greater chance, you know, who'll get sick. So that led me to the idea of like, what could we do to prevent him from getting sick from a public space area that we're walking into, like a doctor's office lobby? Like right. what would be the, like, uh, if we know that a viral load is like, like, uh, like, I don't know, is that a thing? Like my, my thing is like, if, if it's, if he's in a baby carrier, what can I put on that baby carrier to where he has a better chance of not being exposed to anything? Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, I think we, it goes back to if we have this, um, non-evasive test that we can bring people in right um we can we have mechanisms right now where we shuttle people through things like cattle right like um tsa and stuff like that you know so we we use a lot uh you know even dyson uses a bunch of uv lights on their devices in order to kill the things when you're drying your hands and um and and you see the uv lights are being used on things now like drink people are public drink. So if we can confine an area in which we screen people, then it's easy for us to keep that area sanitized as opposed to a waiting room in a, um, you know, because the idea of taking peroxide and creating free radicals and shooting those through the air. Yeah. It does a probably pretty good job of cleaning the air, but it cleans good stuff too. Right. So you got good microbacteria, you got bad microbacteria, you know, you don't, you just don't want to wipe them all out. So, um, so I think maybe the, maybe the answer is to, to create a confining space, you know, like, like when you're walking through a metal detector, you know, cause that's easy to keep clean. And then, you know, you've got a door here for, you know, you're going, you're going COVID room, you know, and then you got over here, healthy baby room. Right. And, uh, I think people are starting to do that. I know my pediatrician has a, a two door, but that's for people who, you know, just have a fever. Yeah, and they're going into one, and 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 it and and also by doing that, so it, it's really funny. Um, there's there's these these. Doors. Why weren't hospitals designed like this from the start? This seems like real common sense. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm going to give you an example of the lack of common sense. So we have these doors on our classrooms. Two, do if you have two doors on your classrooms, everybody comes in one door, and then the exit only door is the other door. Well, if everybody comes in the same door and everybody exits the same door, then your chances of getting it, if you could get it from a surface, it's 100%. Because, <laughs> you know, if, if I divide it and let half the class come in one way and out one way and the other half come in one way and come out that Slip way, coin, at yeah, right. that's at least, I've at least increased it by 50%. But the same way in the hospitals, right? Um, yeah, if to design it so that you kind of get people to where they go and then you disinfect a smaller area but they're not designed that way yeah it's it's really interesting like uh rabbit people ask us the stupidest questions ever um it is what it is and so i just i'm a, you know i'm amazed at how people even come up with these questions and then like our our baby is is due and we're at a hospital and uh everything is like hands free everything just opens for you or shuts for you or whatever and then but there's like but then when you get to like the vending machine area you know, you got to like type in what you want and there's no like wipes. There's no, it's just like, oh, this is free. So everything else like sanitize, do all this stuff. As soon as it's to this, don't worry about it. Um, and then, uh, or like everything's that way, but then the, the button you click to call them. So they'll open the door for you. You still have to click that button. It's like, why isn't, why can't I just click it with my foot? Why does that exist? Yeah, um, why, why isn't an elevator stopping at every floor? <laughs> I don't have to touch any buttons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, I saw a, uh, I'm trying to think where I was. Uh, it was some building that had like a disinfectant, like it was like a wrap around each door handle. And it was saying this wrap is disinfectant. So like every time you touch it, I guess it automatically, how does that work? I don't know how that one works. I saw <laughs> it because my bank has it, right? And uh, it says this is protected by a microfiber that viruses can't survive on or something to that effect. And I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. I've asked myself a bunch, but I just never grabbed it. But I, I trust them, I think. 
um, mainly because of the paper that the virus don't survive on fomite. So, you know, <laughs> fomite. But um, so if you make a, a real complicated fomite, it make it even harder. I don't know. But uh, I've seen it, the microfibers, yeah. and then they put a new one on every day. Yeah. It's, see, it's just weird. That's like uh, we really care. So we don't wear masks, but we really care. So we wear masks. We really care. So we put this microfiber thing in all the doors. We really care. So we make all the doors um, where they automatically open, but it's like, okay, but everybody goes to the same entrance or you don't, you don't require testing. We really, we really care. So everybody's got to be vaccinated. And so I think really care would be testing everybody if unvaccinated people can get in and carry it. Well, and I, you know, I think the big thing with the, you know, vaccine is again going back to the report on the bad ones it's given it's given us a false sense of security um and uh you know my dad my dad is definitely immune compromised in a bad way and he's had he's had the the double shot for the vaccine and so i worry you know because he's got this confidence on him (laughs) that you know that he's bulletproof and uh so so i'm in uh jatsonville and i see uh, one of my best friends, Pablo, and he is just like, give me a hug. Got vaccinated today. I mean, you know, just like this extreme confidence. And I, I didn't say anything. I was like, well, this is what you need, you know, cause we were, we were hanging out before when he's really worried about getting COVID. Uh, and I just said, Hey man, if you're actually worried, you should wear goggles too. Like, you know, cause they say it's like eyes and mouth. And I was like, so you're just covering your mouth. Like if you're actually really scared of this, you need to wear an N95. Like he's wearing like a, just a normal face covering, you know, like okay. you need to wear an N95 and you need to wear goggles or this is just, you're just doing lip service to it. Right. But it's, it's this weird, you know, I think, I don't know. I think the confidence is good. Like if, if people believe they're not going to be sick, I think that it helps them. Well, yeah. And there's always, there's always a placebo effect that they talk about it. Right. I mean, your immunity system is so much better when you're not under stress, but if you're under stress, and uh, I think we probably saw a lot of that, too, because it was a very depressive time uh, at the beginning of COVID. We isolated everybody, and there was, you know, and, um, you know, that type of stress causes the immune system to really deplete. And, um, and uh, so, no, I'm with you. You know, I'm, my dad's happy, you know, and I'm <laughs> happy for him. And, you know, I'm glad because he's assisted living at the moment. And, um, and so I can go and visit him and... You know, everything's fine for him, and so he's happy with it. So it's great. You know, just looking at the data of people that, like, get sick. It wasn't people that looked like me. Um, so when I finally got COVID in September, um, not this year, September 2020, I I was like, I, I just didn't think I had it. So I had, like, a 102-degree fever. I had body aches. Um, and I just felt, like, terrible. And I was in Miami when I got it and I was like flying back to town. I was like, Oh, I'll go rest when I get home. And it wasn't until I bit into a taco and couldn't taste anything that I realized like, Oh, (laughs) so was it, so on the first time, I mean this, I always ask people about the two, two times because was that a test and you, you seemingly were asymptomatic, but on the second time, clearly no loss. uh, First time was super bad. Oh yeah. And lost sense of taste, lost sense of smell, uh, had the body aches. I did everything, but I was always able to breathe well. Um, Now, (laughs) this probably has nothing to do with it. But one of the things I've worked on for years is my ability to hold my breath for a really long time. So, like, for years, I've been practicing holding my breath for, like, five minutes. So, I don't know if that gave me strong lungs or that helps or whatever the case is. But I had no issue with, like, breathing ever. Uh, so that was first time it was just rough with the body aches and the fever and then not being able to taste or smell anything even after I was done with it. So, you know, like five weeks after I was finished with COVID, like way over it, I still could not smell anything. Hmm. So that was like just miserable. Yeah, miserable. Not being able to taste anything was, I just ate salads for the first time in my life and just like, you know, I might as well eat cardboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then second time was super light. I had it for like probably one day. I mean, like it was a positive, but it was just like, I, I knew, uh, I was like, man, I feel strange. And I was like, when's the last time I felt like this? And then I remember like, oh, day one of when I had COVID. Yeah. One of the so, things that, you know, people, you know, the, the angst about using PCR is we always get exposed to the virus. It's not that we don't have the virus in us. It's how our body handles the virus. So, uh, and 
for some reason, other people have a complete disconnect. They say, okay, well, I got this PCR test and it says it's positive, but I'm asymptomatic right now. Well, yeah, they did the 40,000, like you were saying, <laughs> 40,000 cycles up there and you may have had some viral load in there, but your body fought it off and it did its thing because that's what it does. Um, but uh, yeah, but we, we, we kind of ignored that. And so the PCR test is really... Um, you know, a lot of doctors have come out on it and said, you know, there's a reason why we don't use this test for the flu and for other things. It's because <laughs> you can, people are going to be exposed to it. You know, I may have the flu all the time, but my body just fights it off. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. It's so so then we, and then we talk about asymptomatic. So if you put together the fact that a person is asymptomatic, but they could have the viral load and their body's fighting it, then they're not spreading the disease, right? <laughs> they just happen to get it from somebody. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it makes it weird. So when it comes to making instruments, um, are you kind of like an engineer? I mean, like, how do you learn to, like, assemble things? <laughs> yeah, there's a wonderful book that uh, a colleague of mine uh, from Purdue um, put me onto it, and it's called Thing Knowledge, and it and it's it's the philosophy of people who think literally, uh, think uh, uh, verbally, and people who think graphically. You know, so for me, it's always been. I think it's a rebel thing. My dad has a degree in theology, has a degree in English, um, so I did the opposite of that, right? And um, so I see things more graphically, like how they're connected and how they work, and I'm interested in what's behind the curtain kind of thing, and. Um, so I've always had that, uh, Legos, Tinker Toys, everything from the day I was born. And my grandfather fed it into me too. He saw it in me. So he bought me my very first computer, which was TRS-80 MC-10 that I stuck on a color TV back in, uh, gosh, it must have been 1980, 79 or something. And then, and then microscopes and all kinds of stuff as I was coming up. And so it's, it, it, it's hard to be a chemist and do engineering. You've got a bridge. You've got to do two roles. It's a lot of times there's a disconnect between pure science, the biology, chemistry, physics, and then the engineering side of it, the applied side. And um, we don't spend a lot of time talking to each other. So I was lucky along my way, especially at Texas A&M, where um, I had this wonderful machining teacher that taught us how to machine, not to be machinists, but so that I could communicate machine. And... Um, and so I had these wonderful opportunities that just put me in between pure science and the applied side. So I can see the pure science and chemistry, but then I can try to create it. I know enough to create a device. Um, so are you, who's doing the computer programming? You know, like you're putting all those devices in and then it's got to tell a microchip that this now person tested positive. Yeah, we do our own stuff. So I, uh, from that very first Morgan Kid story I told you on the spectrometer we built, uh, we did all the programming in Fortran on an old VAC system. And uh, so I learned Fortran very early and basic, of course, with my TRS-80. And now I, I mean, I program C++. I'm not a savvy Python, all of that stuff like um, my students are. Um, but uh, so they do all the machine learning and big data kind of programming because they're used to that Python language. But for me, I if 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 it's to communicate with the hardware and to do a job, and for me also, I just need to make it functional, right? I need to show investors or the public or peer reviewed committees or whatever that this is what it does. Um, I always leave it to the company to make it red light, green light, right? Because um, for me, it's a mass spectrum, and I can see the mass spectrum, and I can tell what's there. But you, that's twenty years of analytical knowledge and you don't want to teach an end user that you want to red light green light right <laughs> isolate this person do something you know tell let them have a decision tree to tell them to do that and we don't do any of that i mean we i can speak that language but i don't i can't program i can program arduinos and raspberry pi and i still do that um in fact i i really do like it enjoy doing it so how are you not worth like a billion dollars I don't know. My students go out and they get jobs that pay much better than mine. <laughs> and I, I find that as kind of, maybe that's my pride. Um, you know, um, C.S. Lewis once said, um, you can tell the difference between good pride and bad pride in that the good pride um, is if you were just as excited as if your friend did that as you did. 
But if you're only excited because you did it, that's kind of the bad pride. So I, my, I'm kind of counting as my good pride is that my students go out there and they do really well. They're all, I have one academic, the rest of them all corporate output. <laughs> so I run my lab that way, which means my attrition rate in my lab is pretty high because sometimes you just, it's hard to get the students out of the academic mindset, but I'm training them to be corporate folks and they are fantastic. They're so much better than I am. And so I, I really take a lot of pride in being able to set them on a path that I know if I teach them this subset, they'll be able to take it much further than I could ever do with much more resources than I can. So um, they're spread out all over the country and all kinds of great jobs, and I just couldn't be more proud. So I just like it. I, it's, a, it's a great living, great job, great city. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it, in my mind, it's like, okay, this, let's just take the, the smell thing you have. Like, I, I guess you don't own the full IP to it and stuff, but like you could easily sell that to a billion dollar game company for a hundred million dollar deal where they pay 10 million, you know, $10 million a year for 10 years. And maybe it's 50% in stocks. It's 50 million cash, 50 million in stock. Their stock rises an average of 12% a year. So really at the payout stretcher, it's going to cost them nothing and they're going to acquire your IP. And then once they acquire your IP, they can resell it to other game companies, whatever. Like I just look at this and I'm like, this is such an, like if you're running M and a for a, a game company, like this is, this is the thing. Yeah. And that's, and that, we're, and I'm at the teetering point now. So there's probably four, four or five of our patents that are licensed out to that end goal. But in each one of those cases where we're still at the forefront of, you know, we've built 20 instruments, you know, or we're waiting for emergency use authorization or in the remote smell case, I'm looking for, you know, um, you know, PlayStation to call me up and tell me that <laughs> they're going to write me a hundred million dollar check. But yeah, I mean, the hope is that, I mean, if I get a high royalty exchange from university of North Texas, then um, yeah, that will be nice. I, I, <laughs> I look forward to that. But um yeah, and I think, you know, with patent process, patent process is kind of a weird thing. Um, you kind of shoot your foot because you, in order to get something patented, we make it public knowledge. Yeah. And it just weird. seems a little, um, yeah, odd. I mean, of course, that can take us back to the COVID thing, of course, right? Because there's a patent that came out in 2007 on how to make your own coronavirus. But um, <laughs> the... Uh, but Dr. For the, Tony Fauci. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't him on there, but. Uh. <laughs> My favorite, uh, like, c comedy skit right now is this guy is like, have you ever met a Dr. Tony before? Like, I'm not saying anything about this, but like, do you know how suspicious it would be if a guy walked in? He's like, how you doing? I'm Dr. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You'd be like, what? Right. <laughs> That's right. It's funny. It's weird that he's like above reproach. It's so strange. It is. It's uh, <laughs> he's like this. He looks like he's like five foot two. He's got this annoying voice. I can't. I can't. <laughs> yeah, it's hard for me to escape compliance ever, and uh, as you can imagine. But um, yeah, I lied about the mask because our healthcare workers needed them. This dude just lied to Congress, and nobody gives. A, <laughs> nobody cares. That's, That's crazy. If Trump lied to Congress, the world would erupt. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a it's it's a single edged sword. Um. Anyway, uh, okay. So there just seems to be, you know, from what I'm hearing from you is like, hey, I developed some really cool technology, but the technology being developed to ready to go to market is a twenty year span. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, well, I mean, in my case, it, it was because it took me a long time to get to that point. But I, I think for the most part, I think most of these things that we're looking at now is probably two year, two year span um, at this point. So we've moved it. So there's this um, mechanism that we always use called technical readiness level. And um, uh, Department of Defense and NASA use it uh, to describe how far technology has gone and where it's going. And um, so... Um, uh, nine is it's sold to the people and everything's good. And zero is, Hey, I wonder if we could make a, you know, right. So where are you on that scale? 
And I think right now we're probably at six or seven. We've made a prototype. The device works. We've sent it out to an engineering manufacturing firm. They've made 10 more units. Um, so now the waiting game is always something like emergency use authorization or um, – and you would think emergency use authorization would be a pretty fast process, right? Because it is called emergency use authorization. <laughs> but is it run by our federal government? <laughs> it's FDA. It's yeah. an FDA approval <laughs> process. But uh, so it does have its uh, slow points. But um, we're very hopeful for that. Once we get to that point and we can really try to get a non-invasive test out there, it's a game changer, right? And uh, I think other people are trying it. There are... There are other companies out there that realize that breath biopsy is it. The um, first conference, um, Al Stone is offering uh, this um, next week in England. And I, it's all virtual, of course. But um, I'm the second speaker in that, conversa- in that uh, conference to really start pushing breath biopsy as a mechanism. I mean, breath biopsy is phenomenal. Uh, acetone has long been a, um, a marker for diabetes. Um, you can see it for people who have breast cancer or lung cancer. Um, you can look at, we were talking about before, uh, drugs of abuse, um, COVID, disease states. You know, we're exploring with another group. Can we see things like, um, uh, and we'll probably be able to see tuberculosis, but where are you going to do that test, right? You need a BSL crazy lab for doing any type of tuberculosis, but it's possible to do that, and um, strep. So um, I think breath biopsy is our future. Um, You know, we make sensitivity of the instruments gets better and better, and we have the ability now to to do breath biopsy, and I think that's the – I mean, it's non-invasive. It's coming out anyway, so if you can detect it (laughs) – Yeah, Yeah, because I'm over here thinking like, man, once I'm of a rabbit – and I do my next thing, which who knows what that will be, or I'm just even other entrepreneurs or whatever. Like there seems to be this gold mine of people doing really cool shit like you, that it's like, if I can plug into that and just have a list of like the latest and greatest things that there could be a huge market and be like, okay, yep, that's one I can easily prioritize and bring to market and scale. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's going back to the same problem is that the, the gulf between corporate and academia, some people have got these things figured out, but most academics are like, look, I did it, you know, and, and you can get the Nobel prize because you were the first one to do it and, uh, and never do anything else again, you know, go back and get <laughs> another grant. Right. And we kind of injure ourselves in that when I first started, there was a real big push for federal funding, federal funding, federal funding, federal funding. I'm like, well, I'm really this corporate guy. You know, I'm not really this, I'm a forensic scientist slash instrument maker. And so I introduced the university to a lot of corporate funding, right? And contracts and stuff. And it was, it was a huge disconnect because people would say to me, well, you're not doing a good job because you're not getting enough federal funding. Yeah, but federal fundings are dead ends. Sometimes they're dead ends. Sometimes they come up with great stuff. And I think federal funding now is getting smart where they're saying, what can you show me at the end of this grant, right? Let me show me something tangible that you did. It only took me over a minute how long to say that. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and I just, I can't do that. I want, I want to create the tangible, hold it in your hand. Look, see here, here it is. And yep. then- But it also leads kind of you want to make a difference because you're not making a difference if it's not out there. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You can claim it all you want. It's yeah. There's there's an old argument in our in our area in mass spectrometry where one one of the person who started it got the got the Nobel Prize for it. We only did a few experiments. It was this other fella um, that developed it for ten years and created this huge market for the instrument, and the whole group was upset because well the nobel prize should have gone to this guy well that's not what the nobel prize is for (laughs) nobel prize is forever thought of it first and clearly this guy thought of it first but but you're right um we have to break that we we need to have good conversations between academics and and get them excited about coming with yeah because value is created and and change is created through the value and so what it's like, cool, when there's something completely new, I mean, this is just really cool. Like everyone, almost everybody's ripping off things and like, this isn't, this isn't ripping off things. This is like a new thing. 
And I mean, I guess everything could eventually be linked back to something, right? But um, my favorite, <laughs> do you get this a lot where somebody goes, you know, I had that idea too. <laughs> I had an idea that what if we could just blow into something and it sets if it's COVID or not. It's like, yeah, you also drive a big rig for a living. Yeah, like having that idea, like it's like, I love, like I had the idea for Uber. Yeah. <laughs> Is that impressive? Like. What a crazy idea. Like, I, hey, I wonder if there was an app to get a taxi cab instead of having to wave my hand. Wow, what a genius. I'm sure you're the only person. You and Cal <laughs> and Kaepernick, whatever his name is, uh, Uber C, former CEO. Um, you know, I mean, it's just so so crazy to me that people say stuff like that. I had that idea. It's like, yeah, it's not a big, like a lot of people did. No, make it, move <laughs> it forward. I mean, I know my limitations and marketing is it, right? Um, I'm clearly not gifted in that way at all. Um, I am at being able to digest something down. Yeah, you're able to communicate really well, right? Which is marketing, right? You but just I probably don't care about marketing. Yeah, I yeah, it's it's I don't I don't think it's my people, right? You know, it's, I'm like I'm like mm, I don't know, you know, gotta go to this big dinner party. I gotta wear a tie and I gotta <laughs> I gotta well, do this. I think what it is is that um, a lot of let's say you develop a, a huge solution to something. And a marketer will say, okay, I got to educate the public on this. That's a nightmare. But this one little piece could be used for this. And you're like, oh, but it can do all this. <laughs> and that's often the the miscommunication. You know, like when, when people, when uh, developers launch their own software, it's clear that a developer made it because it has about 9,000 features and 8,000 of them nobody cares about. And, you know, it's all these, but when I launch a product, you know, it will have three features, it'll do three things really, really well. And developers will sit there and go, oh, that's so stupid. Uh, you know, like it needs to do this, needs to do that. I'm like, nope. I don't want to confuse people. I just want them to be like, oh, this made sense. And then they sign up. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I, you know, I mean, that's brilliant. Um, one, I can't think of every, uh, failure, of course, that my device is going to have. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't envy the app developer when they get to that point because I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, don't hold it that way. You know, <laughs> you know don't look at it the wrong way. Um, here's a good example of marketing and like, or here's a good example of relate like relationships control everything. Like relationships control whether your business is successful or not. Like um, I, I asked a guy, I'm thinking about joining a, another mastermind group, and I said, how many people in this group – uh, work like, you know, or work and have an advertising company essentially, or have a marketing agency. Um, and I was like, and he's like, well, you know, there's a few others, but you shouldn't worry about that. Or maybe ask them like, how plugged in are they with the group? You know, like, do, is there anybody here that dominates this group? And he's like, well, if you do really good work, you shouldn't have to worry about that. And I go, well, your job is a salesman. So you're trying to convince me that, but the truth is my work could be terrible, but as long as people like me, I'll do really well. And that's just the fact. I mean, if you're doing something at a large scale, like Tesla, for example, which even then, like there's some people have such brand loyalty, it can be not as good and doesn't matter anymore. But it's not about, it's very rarely about the product. It's just about like your relationships. And I think a great example of this is like Tetsa's Instruments. Like how does Tetsa's Instruments, I don't know if they're a billion dollar company, but how are they super successful? Because they somehow convinced every single high school in every single college to require every single student to have one of their calculators. Yeah, that's right. Brilliant. I'm sure there's better calculators out there. I'm sure there was better everything. I would always argue it was HP, but, you know, <laughs> it died a horrible death. But. <laughs> but somebody at Touches Instruments had the relationship or had the marketing department or had the marketing campaign in the same way that uh, – you know, a diamond company convinced people that diamonds were rare and valuable, two things that are not. <laughs> and now you can cr create them in a lab. So <laughs> they're not rare, they're not valuable, and they can be man-made and look almost identical. Um, okay. Identical to the human eye, it's just under a microscope. You can see the differences. They have to add flaws to them. Yeah, do you know the chemistry behind that? Have you yeah. Seen that? Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, so so finish Tetsu's instrument real quick. And we'll go oh, on. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but, but, you know... That's what Tetz, Tetz's Instruments did, just what the Diamond Company did. Somehow. I mean, I, would, I don't know the case study behind it, but I've just thought about that. When you think about, wow, like Tetz's Instruments is at every university and every single high school. There's other people that make calculators. They just somehow 
got in there. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think that's probably going to be true too for the breath biopsy part is where is the entry point for the instrument, right? If we go too far and COVID starts to fall off, people might say, okay, that was a great idea. Sorry, I didn't get to market fast enough, right? So, you know, that was my whole idea from the beginning. Let's not pigeonhole ourselves into a single use, right? Because a marketing guy is going to say, well, what can you do this? Can can every student have it in their backpack, right? Like yeah. Jackson's well, mother. and you look at it this way is, um, have you ever seen like websites where it's like, uh, we solve problems and then solve will get deleted and it will type out fits and that will get deleted. You know, it's like a, like, you know what I'm talking right. about? Like an animation of like, oh, we actually do all these things. You see one word at a time, it deletes, it adds another word. And so it starts out like, hey, we detect COVID. And then it's like, we detect COVID, the flu, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like these, like, you just, everything expands upon it. But if you had a really cool logo and you had a really cool video, you know, if your videos look like a Steve Jobs presentation where he's just holding up an iPod, you know, if you have nice rounded corners and good packaging, that can make just as big of a difference of that school. You know, if, let's say you're trying to sell this to universities so everybody gets tested every morning when they walk into school. It's like... If it's your product and everybody else is just like you, so it's a gray box with it looks like a PC, and then I come out with the Mac Mini, <laughs> and yeah. you make some cool uh, lights, and you make the lights the brand color of the school you're at. So if you're at UT, you make them that like burn orange or whatever, <laughs> and you're like, this is our product, and I'm there in my suit, and I'm saying, you'll notice the difference between ours. You can feel it. It's made out of aluminum, out of one piece, machined. It's you know, blah, 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 blah. Look at our power cords. They're white, not black. <laughs> you know, and that's like, that's the thing. And it's like, nobody will ever know. But it's like, why do these two companies fail? Because this company had really good, uh, like their brand looked good. Right. And that's the big disconnect between like scientists and marketers. Yeah. And it, and it is because, you, you know, you, even if you go to a school, you could make it a robot that talked to you. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, the kids would love that. They're like, Oh, I went and visited Robbie today and he, you know, he tested me for COVID. Right. As in you went to the gray box. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, no. Okay. Let's talk about man, handmade, man-made diamonds or lab made diamonds. Sure. SP3 carbon. Can you, can you do that with rubies and stuff? Um, uh, yes. I mean, you, you know, you need heat pressure and time. And if you can increase one of those, you can decrease the other one. So if you've got heat pressure and time, those are the three things that you need to create crystal structures, right? So we can grow crystals of different kinds. Um, so the idea is just how much heat and pressure you can do. So if I can keep increasing the pressure more and more and more, um, then I can create the order with less and less heat or with less and less time. And, uh, of course, you know, a diamond, a fern decaying into the carbon, into the earth, becoming coal, and then eventually becoming diamond. That's a long process with not a lot of pressure and not a lot of heat, not co compared to what we can do. You know, we can, we can exceed the temperature of the sun now in the lab if we want to with plasmas and all kinds of things. So, um, right. So we can. So the question then becomes, is the output, whatever it is that you're making, worth the input. So if I have to create a plasma temperature of 5,000 Kelvin or something crazy, that takes energy and that energy has got to be translated. So um, I think some of the man-made diamonds right now that we're making are approaching the cost of what a diamond is. Um, so if we keep getting better and we drive that price down, then the synthetic market will the, the, then the mar it'll be a marketing guy comes back out and says, hey, but this is a natural well, that's product. What, so that's, this is organic. Well, what they're doing now is they're saying this is uh, doesn't like blood diamond is essential. They're saying like, hey, like no kid. Uh, oh, died for this. Huh? Yeah. 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 Like so, that's it's ethical diamond. That's the word. Yeah. yeah. They're saying ethical diamonds is how they pitch it. And it is it's like 30 percent cheaper than a real one. My thing is, like, if it's 70% cheaper, I'll consider it. But for 30, I'll just, like, get a real one. But even then, I'm like, it's kind of stupid. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> so, so the synthetic, you know, they probably made rubies. I, well, I mean, I know that uh, um, 
uh, sapphire, which is that class. Um, they make they make them synthetic because we use them as spacers because we can control the size very precisely. So if you need if you need two spacers that are identical, I mean they have no difference, then you have to do that with sapphire, and uh, and those are made. So they're not as pretty as they're clear. It just seems like how crazy could it be that if like at one point Rolex and Rolex would never do this, but you know, Rolex is like, cool, we're just going to buy this million dollar machine that made diamonds all day. <laughs> yeah. And like now we've just drastically cut cause they still, they're certified diamonds because they say it's the same amount of pressure. It's the same, like it's just as sharp as a diamond, all the things um, that it's legally a diamond. It's kind of funny that we actually measure um, how real a diamond is based on the impurities or inclusions that are in it because that's the tattletale sign, right? If I make it in the lab, it's perfect carbon, right? And um, so um, when you, you shine a light through it, you don't see any inclusions or particles and you know it was probably man-made. And uh, Yeah, because so if I was to start a watch company, I think that's what I'd do. I'd be like, can I buy a machine that makes diamonds? That, that will help us in the long run. Yeah. yeah it'd be a lot <laughs> or if you were like a jewelry company. <laughs> Much better. Yep. So weird. So weird. Which one? I don't know. I haven't heard of that. So term. I can answer that for you, actually. So mesonoite is uh not quite it's the second hardest stone apparently behind a diamond uh it has a lot more sparkle than a diamond like a lot more sparkle um and it's 70 percent cheaper than a diamond oh my and it can be lab made too um so anyway mesonoids a very interesting one i think it will catch on in the next couple of years i'm gonna take a look at that um, one yeah, yeah that's it's super sparkly like really sparkly it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I'm sure some rappers talk about their diamond chains, but they're really mesonoid. <laughs> you can't really tell. I mean. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my favorite is when these rappers pay like 200 grand for a watch and it turns out it's fake. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at least uh, one of my students came back with a Rolex and said, yeah, I got it off a street vendor in New York. It was 25 bucks. I'm like, well, at least you know what you got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least he didn't charge you $1,000 for that. <laughs> they make uh, China sells fake Rolexes that are like a grand. Like, they're not cheap. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, and they're probably, the mechanism's probably smooth and everything. <laughs> I don't know. It's so, you know, at that point, you're buying it because of your ego uh, like some people say, oh, I'm just buying because I like it. It's like, well, then just buy that. I don't know. Like, I, I often get into a thing. I just feel weird about having something that isn't real. Because um, I don't, like, to me, as a maker of things, I know what it's like to rip. Like, I don't want people to rip me off. Right. So, like, the IP of it I actually care about. I'm like, hey, like, you can have a watch that's just like Rolex, but if it, and remove that logo, and that's fine. But if it has the logo on it and Rolex didn't put it on it, that's illegal <laughs> yeah we um in in the academic and i just went through this process we have a very strong uh group on the campus that does conflict of interest groups because as you can imagine like you were saying with homes this is a good example is that you know i could come and sell my idea and my science because i'm profiting and not because of the science so one of the nice things about in the academic world is the conflict of interest part and I think if more corporations knew about that, um, they would trust the academic route a little bit more, at least for their ground level research. Because if they, if the university has a good COI group like ours does, um, you know, they ask what me does all CIO mean? Com conflict of interest. Okay. It just means that, um, you know, when when I put a paper out there that's peer reviewed, I need another pair of eyes on it. Why? Because I'm about to sell this device and make a million dollars. So I'll sell the public on whatever I think they want to know that it will do. And that's not, the, you know, that's not science. So in, in science, we need to be able to say the peer review process was held up, even though the guy is going to make a million dollars on the product, <laughs> right? And that type of integrity um, you know, I kind of, I kind of respect that um, that the university still has 
those pieces in place to keep sign. And we still have the peer review process, right? So there's a few purities that are left. They're getting corrupted, right? But, um, but there are a few things that still keep us. And people want to do the right thing, I hope. <laughs> you know, so. One of my favorite things is, have you seen the sign that some people put in the yard that's like, this family, we believe in science. We believe love is love. We believe Black Lives Matter. It's like just this like, um, like woke sign kind of thing. And my favorite is it's like, what they really mean is we believe in science if it supports our narratives. <laughs> that's right. And, and most of it is really what we call scientism. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I've replaced one faith-based system with another because when you ask me, well, how come we don't, how come we have relativity, which is true. And how come we have quantum mechanics, which is true. They both work. But they're at odds at each other. So when you ask that, the, the answer is, well, well, we'll figure it out. Right. Okay. That's faith. <laughs> it's not science. <laughs> you, you just plugged in a faith-based system. And so we're trying to avoid that. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop working on the problem and we shouldn't stop seeking truth. We should do that all the time. But recognize in yourself that you're you're taking somebody is taking your science and producing a narrative for an op ed piece. It's not peer reviewable. It's not conflict of interestable. None of that stuff could happen to that, but they want to sell you on it. And that's that's replacing science with faith, with a faith based system. And so so your religion is scientism. Okay. All right. My, uh, my favorite is when people form their opinion based on one person they know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, like, That's look, right. my friend, he's 25 years old. He died of COVID. It's dangerous. It's like, okay, well, if we look at the data, your friend is, like, one in, oh, like, a huge 100 amount. million. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, five the, nines. Yeah, like, the chances of, like, if you look, if you compare him to other 25-year-olds, that like, let's say there's been 120 hours of die COVID, and there's, uh, you know, 50 million in the U.S., like, that's the chances right there. Yeah. Um, and so it, I just love when people's, um, or this is, my mom uh, did this. She was like, you know, I have a rare blood type. <laughs> this is my mom. This is me pretending about it. I have a rare blood type. And she doesn't sound like that. But in my head, that's such a thing. I have a rare blood type that I don't get sick a lot. And I was around, she has a friend, Kim, that got COVID. And she's like, I was around Kim a lot. And I didn't get COVID. So therefore, I just don't think I'll get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh. I was like, okay, I got it. My wife didn't get it. And then six months later, oops, sorry, three months later, she got it and I didn't get it. Well, and also your mom gave you your blood type, didn't she? Don't you have the same blood type? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, you don't? Because it's, it's typically the mom's blood type no, is the baby's blood type. No, I got a weird one that I, nobody How else come? in our family has. Oh, okay. That's uh, interesting. Well, maybe. maybe. Yeah. You know, the, and <laughs> so there was, it's a funny story about that. When they came out with the initial uh, stories about, you know, people with O positive have, you know, less susceptibility of getting it and stuff like that. I was like, oh, that's bull. I don't, but it doesn't even sound like science. So I go back and there's an actual study on tuberculosis where people with AB type uh, have, are less symptomatic and, you know, and, and I said, oh, so it's interesting. So then I read, so the paper finally came out, peer review paper came out last month and A, the type A antibody, I think it's the type A, not the B, gives COVID another substrate. So it, it, remember that puzzle piece I was telling you about, the perfect fit? A does that. And so um, the likelihood for people who have A or AB blood um, is giving COVID a, a higher place to, to bind, which is why the numbers look skewed for O positive people. But, you know, people with B are probably still in the O camp. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. How do we do that though? Why do we like assume that we're the test group? Oh yeah, we always do. So crazy to me. <laughs> well, and that's part of the problem too with the vaccine world. Um, on that is we had a control group that we don't have because we felt bad for the control group, so we got them vaccinated. So now we don't have a control group. <laughs> so we used to have this control group and to see. <laughs> so, I mean, if I was a conspiracy guy, I would say that's a little bit crazy. In science, you got to keep your control group. So. Yeah. 
Um, it's it is funny if people want to end an argument, they just go with science. You can't argue with that's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and so I I tell the students, I said, you know, I agree with that, but you got to show me that peer reviewed article. Show it to me, and it, and it still doesn't make it true. Yeah. Right. Um, it made it true that it got through the peer review process, but um, yeah, I want to see the science. You know, I yeah, like how often are articles. You know, somebody published an article that ets ets and y equals z. And does somebody come out five years later and go, actually, that's why it doesn't equal Z? Yeah, now that happens all the time just because our knowledge of science changes. And so instruments will say, oh, we used to think that that was this way, and now it's we know it's this See, way. See, people treat they, people talk about science now like it's the law. <laughs> right. We do have some laws, which, you know— um, you know, like uh, gravity, for instance, yeah. that's a good one. We don't know how it works, but we <laughs> we, we know it always works. Um, <clears throat> Wait, do we really not know how gravity works? No. I mean, we know the equation for gravity, but h- how the forces and, and molecular forces are actually working on each other? No, nah, not yet. Yeah. Wow, so, no clue. Nope, no. Nope. <laughs> We're getting closer, maybe. But uh, we do have those kinds of laws, but most everything, yeah, the peer review process never creates a law. Do you know anything about the, okay, so uh, some people's problem with the vaccine is that it's RDNA or something? Oh, um, yeah, it's um, messenger RNA, yeah. mRNA. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, in the case of the vaccine, um, yeah, this is where I disagree a little bit with the folks because it was designed to have um, one of the organelles that's outside the nucleus hijack it. What does that mean? It, okay. Um, so messenger RNA is going to create a protein. Okay. Um, it's the, it's the language for the protein. It is whatever that sequence is tells the body how to assemble a protein, amino acid sequence. Okay. So, and that protein mimics the foot of the coronavirus. So, um, so Moderna has one mRNA sequence that's called certain something. And then Pfizer has one that's called certain something. And, um, but both of them, um, are essentially hijacked by this organelle and it replicates uh, this foot. And then the hopes is, I mean, it's not mechanistically and scientifically, it's a great idea. That foot goes out and then an antibody comes and matches the foot. Now, if that is a, a really a perfect match for coronavirus, then, um, then your body will know how to fight it, right? When it comes encounter with that foot again. So that's sort of the idea of how that vaccine works. Now, we've been playing with that technology for quite a long time. Um, and it's still, you know, it's still in, in a lot of the scientific stages of it, as we can tell from the Mayo Clinic report, um, that we haven't perfected. But I, I think there's hope for that technology. Um, but I also think that we probably ought to do it the right way, right? I mean, create something and then do good tests. I mean, it's always good that you have a virus out there that you can test it against, but sometimes I don't want to be a guinea pig either. Yeah. Is there, so I, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, but like, uh, apparently with some people when they were testing this on rats, some not people, when they were testing this on rats, that it would beat whatever virus the rat was facing. Like it would, it would, it matched up perfectly. It would kill, kill it. But then their immune system wasn't ready for any other virus. Like it just trained it to kill that one. And so then when they got like a cold, they were like really sick. They weakened their overall immune system, but it strengthened their immune system against that one virus. Hmm. That's interesting. The, the, the thing that I'll, I don't know much about that one, but the one thing that is the delivery system is a liposome. And the liposome can actually allow that mRNA to go places that, the virus may not be able to go. So that's one of the controversies right now with it. Um, And we don't have enough information yet. But if I have a liposome, what's the problem now where if it's not going through the blood brain, the virus can't get through the blood brain barrier right now. But now I send this foot through there, um, or this mRNA through there, and it creates it in an area that is normally not accustomed to fighting it, what will happen? Right? And so some people are arguing right now that they see... Uh, reproductive issues or neurological issues or things where um, this vaccine might be going that the virus can't go or wouldn't attack normally. Um, 
you know, I don't know much about that, but it sounds like a good argument right now because our delivery system is made to cross membranes. That's, that's why we put it in a liposome. Um, you put that liposome in your body and it's going to be able to cross the membranes that go to your lungs, the membranes that go to your blood, brain, kidneys, heart, everywhere. Um, um, so, yeah. Do you think there's some scientists that are like full of shit and they like, because they don't do peer reviews, you know, like let's say they were former scientists or current scientists, but they don't do anything peer review. They're not a university. They're just like big on YouTube or whatever. And they just kind of use their platform to act like you have to submit to me. I know everything. Yes, there are quite a lot of that. <laughs> Some of them even don't have science degrees, right? Um, and so, yeah, some of them are, right, they're using their platform for, you know, sort of the political output of it or to strengthen the side of an argument or they're paid to play, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What the, are the credentials you should ask? Like, if somebody's saying, hey, I'm a scientist and uh, – you know, you will die if you don't get the COVID vaccine. I'm a scientist. Right. I would, I would say you're an immunologist, right? Or you're a virologist, right? Um, I mean, even in my case, I mean, I'm chemistry, biochemistry, and I do a lot of biochemistry work, but I know the specific markers. If you're going to ask me, you know, I mean, I know s most of the cycle that COVID does because I had to write the introduction to the paper, <laughs> but, but I, I referenced everybody else's work. So if you were going to ask me, oh, well, how do those aldehydes and ketones actually get created? This, it's unimportant to me. What's important to me is that they were created and I can detect them. But it would be important if a person was to come to me and say, well, how do you know that those aldehydes and ketones came from COVID, right? And, um, and so we deal a lot of this on the, on the forensic side when you have to go to the courtroom and testify. Um, there's a credential process and these lawyers will beat you up with it, right? Like, how do you know that? Why do you know that? You've never written a paper on that. You've never done that. That's the type of thing that I would like to see um, occur before we start throwing out data in the public media is what are this guy's credentials? How do we know that um, he knows this? Who Who's his team? Who does he have as a team? And his team... You know, credible in this area. Um, yeah, because, um, <laughs> politics. We know that's probably not true, but <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm interested. You know, like what's the question to really like you know tell like okay, what are your credentials? Like you say you're a scientist, but what are your exact credentials? You know, because I just think that if we ask that on both sides, we'll be like you know like I I for example really like Rand Paul, but he's he's not immune as all. You know, I mean he quotes peer reviewed studies when he's like going after people, <laughs> but. <laughs> He's not a, you know, he was like an eye doctor, right? Like, <laughs> I don't, you know? right. Um, and so I don't look at him as a scientist. I, the stuff he quotes tends to often be true and like is peer reviewed and from studies in Israel and all over the world. And he seems to come with like fats and data. Um, but uh, I think on both sides, there could just be a, okay, what are your credentials to where, you know, it's like in his case, he's like, well, I'm quoting these studies and some people's case they go, oh, well, I'm a scientist. And they just end it right there and people go, oh, okay, great. <laughs> and then it starts yeah. this rumor of like, well, my friend who's a scientist says. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And then it propagates. Yeah. <laughs> that and my other uh, biggest pet peeve in the media outlet is the use of percentages. Because what people don't realize is they think percent is a unit. It's not. It's just one one hundredth of, of, a, of a unitless <laughs> value. And so you have to divide dollars by dollars to get percent, which means it's unitless. And if it's unitless, it means that you have to have context. So you can't just tell me, oh, 60% of people died from COVID. Wait, wait a second. It's a unitless value and 60% of who or what or where or, and where is the context for this of the people that got COVID, they died of 60% or, yeah. And yeah. so age sets, location, average income. Like I think average income is really important because that tells me their living standards. Right. Right. Or, and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like that, that um, and social thing. standards would definitely, I mean, look at, we were talking about Brazil early on there for social standards. There's nobody better, more social than Brazil. <laughs> right. And so were we surprised that their numbers were off the hook? No, these people. Yeah. Uh, my wife is, is we just had our first kid. So she's scared of everything. Um, I 
am a kind of a data guy. So I'm like, look, people have kids all the time that end up fine. And what are the chances be us people that like actually love our kid and take good care of them? Like, it's just like, to me, I'm just like, nothing's everything's going to be fine. But <laughs> she's like, Oh man, I'm just afraid he's going to get SIDS. <laughs> so oh I just like, just Google this. What's the average income of the family whose baby gets SID, SIDS? And it's like poverty line below the po- poverty line or below. Oh wow. It's like, okay, cool. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know if that means anything, but I just know that like, Hey, our, our house is in 80 degrees. <laughs> yeah, we need, um, yeah, that's exactly right. We, uh, we need all the data, right? It is so much data now. And I, that's the part I like about big data, but big data can be misused, right? Because I can pull variables out of it. Right. <laughs> and I can skew the numbers that, to, go to do back. with it, but just make it pull. Well, and then I can, yeah. I give an, I give people a new faith based system. It's called big data. Yeah. So what did you do? Oh, I ran big data on that. Well, there's about 500 algorithms that you could run big data on. What, what was your algorithm? What was your, yeah. And that's why I just love to just present, like present things. I think that, I mean, that is the best thing you can do is just like say, all right, look, here's all the numbers across all the things and then let people, you know, and people say that's bad because then people just run their own way with it. Mm-hmm. I said, well, that's not my, my job was just present factual data. Like as long as the data is good, it should be always paint a semi clear photo. Yeah, it should be. Uh, I mean, uh, and as an analytical chemist, I'm forced to truth seek. I mean, I can't, maybe it's not an option for me, <laughs> right? The people want to know is, is a chemical there and how much? Yeah. And I have to know. Yeah. And, and the truth is like from running, like working in marketing, I've realized I'm almost always wrong. You know, like we, we have an issue at rabbit where people go to return a, a carrot, which is what we call the power bricks. And then they purchase it. Now to purchase it, <laughs> they have to click uh, return. And when they click return, it shows them how to return it and shows an animation and text. And then below that says purchase. And when they click purchase, it goes, uh, you're not returning this. You're purchasing it. Like it gives them all these warnings. And they click okay. And then it goes, are you sure you would like to purchase this and not return it? And they go, okay. And it happens all the time. Almost every day somebody purchases it and then immediately returns it. And the disconnect is their brain can't rack their head around that when they put it back in the kiosk, our system knows which one's returned and cuts it off. They think they have to click something for it. So after two years of this, we've realized instead of one button that says return, we need to have two buttons, one that says return and one that says purchase. And when they click purchase, it takes them through all the prompts and they click return. It has no other buttons. And it just says, you know, stick it in here. <laughs> uh, but that's just, we've launched like nine versions of the app trying to fix this problem. It's amazing. And so you always make these assumptions of like how people are going to, do something and you're like, okay, that's not right. Or email campaigns like all the time. Well, let's say we're sending 400 emails out, uh, uh, you know, all to the same demographic, let's say gym owners, hundred, hundred with one email copy, hundred with, you know, four email copies, hundred each. And, uh, somebody will write an email that I just hate. I'm like, nobody's going to, this sounds so cheesy and stupid and whatever. And then somebody will write, and I'm like, that might be better or whatever. And then I'll write my email, which I think is the best. And I'll come in last place <laughs> or the email I hate the most gets the most opens or the most replies or the most bookings or it gets the most qual. That's another thing. And sometimes you'll, you'll write something, you'll get a ton of bookings, but none of them will be qualified. Like they're not the right type of bookings. Nice. Um, so that's why my thing is like, just present the data and then let people do what they want with it. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I went to your website and uh, <laughs> I was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Oh, I can click here and become a rabbit provider <laughs> at no cost to me. So yeah. I was like, hey, oh, wow, you figured that out. Yeah. Yeah. People ever, the number one question we get is how much is it going to cost me? Well, it says no and cost me. They submit that on that page. They'll oh. fill out a form for it and it will say like additional comments and be like, uh, how much is this a year? <laughs> <laughs> and the button, <laughs> the button to submit it says request your free kiosk. That's the button. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, so, God. I mean, you just never, you really never know. No, um, that's right. And that's why it's like constantly changing. And yeah, I just don't think people have a clear definition of what science is. They think science is like the law for some reason. Yeah, they do. And, uh, and they think that even if it's been tested for a period of time, I mean, it's so progressive, right? We, um, 
I mean, the good example is relativity and quantum mechanics. It's a good one, right? We 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 laid on on you know um, on normal mechanics, natural mechanics for years and years. We we laid on an infinitely old universe. It was Einstein's. Um, statement that he said it was one of the greatest mistakes that he ever made in one of his equations was putting in a universal factor to account for an expanding universe. And when Big Bang came about, um, you know, uh, we had all of science thinking that the universe was infinitely old and would continue for infinity. And um, it wasn't until that moment that they got the Nobel Prize and all of science is rewritten. And so... Um, it didn't make the natural laws go away. Um, it just gave us a, a sharper lens to look at the natural laws and what things are actually going on, and that occurs every day. And so to fall on it as if we all know the end answer to everything, it's just um, it's a lot of pressure on us anyway because I think a lot of my colleagues feel like they have to, right? Yeah. And And they spend their whole time, you know, but I just like my area. You know, I like my niche. I like my world, and I'm just going to continue doing that. I like reading things outside of my world, but I'm not going to become an expert. In that. What does that 20 years look like for you? That is very interesting. Um, you know, that part of the question comes back to the licensing and hits and how that go. I'd like to continue the academic corporate engagement piece. I mean, I am passionate about that from the academic side. There are people like we have in our tech transfer that are corporate folks that engage in the academic side. But I think we need a lot more academics that can engage better in the corporate side and create a safe space <laughs> for <laughs> academics and, and, and uh, corporate folks to get together and have good, honest com 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 communications about what we're going to do. And um, so I like that, and I, I'm trying to niche my way into that. I think is really what I want to do. And uh, I, um, so if you made a hundred million dollars tomorrow. Would you still be a professor? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I only teach two classes a year, but I, um, I love it. Um, the kids, uh, students, sorry, I guess it's not polite to call them kids anymore, but um, <laughs> the students are, um, are still engageable. Um, I think part of the problem with, um, with, students today is they're taught differently. They're coming from a different group. They're coming from a different school system than, than I had come from. And so I, I sometimes have to be adaptive of how I communicate with them, right, and how um, I get information over to them. And so that's a challenge for me every day, but I enjoy it. I love it. Um, we have good conversations. I'm honest about what I don't understand about society. <laughs> so, there, you know, I'm a typical absent-minded geeky professor that I would rather talk about Star Trek and uh, – <laughs> and Doctor Who than any um, any of the social problems in the world. But, but Do you have pronouns in your email? I don't have any pronouns <laughs> in my email. I often jokingly say that um, the way I grew up, the two pronouns are these. They're he, and if you're younger than me, sir. So, uh, <laughs> so that's sort of my upbringing. But. Yeah, it's uh, that's my big thing about like academia as beyond that I like don't like that it's raised every year for 30 years and I don't like that the that the government bats its loans like I wish the government would back loans for companies to buy my products that'd be really great for my business I know <laughs> like hey do you want a hundred thousand dollar app uh oh okay cool well, the government will give you a loan for it yeah and then after it goes live is when you start paying on it, right? Because you don't pay till after you graduate. That's right. Well, and even you can even do a whole bunch of deferment stuff. We had a couple of students that go to grad school just to defer their loans. So as long as they're in school and registered, then they don't have to pay back their loans. So yeah, right. Wouldn't Indeed. that be great? We were like, mm, well, I could do I could do 2.0 of this uh, <laughs> yeah. instrument I built. So I'm going to sustain the... Um, but another thing is like just how silly they've gotten with like pronouns on name tags and just like, that was the first time I'd ever seen that. I was, this was like three or four years ago. I was at Vanderbilt university and, um, uh, a lady had a name tag on that had her pronouns on it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't around a lot of woke people then. And I was just like, I mean, everybody knows you're a, a woman. Like you have a boyfriend, you have a ponytail, you look like a woman. 
<laughs> yeah, nowadays I think that that probably might can't be true. Sometimes I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm confused. So, I uh, yeah, I don't. I choose. You know, um, um, oh God, we we're talking about we were talking about before uh, Canadian um, Canadian pundit um, Canadian Canadian. We're talking about oh, oh what was his name? Because I want to. I want oh, to, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, Jordan Peterson. Sorry. So, yeah, I read his Maps of Meaning book. And um, uh, interesting guy. Interesting career. I mean, interesting change from the Maps of Meaning to, to where he is now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, part of the idea, too, is that you have to accept the fact that I don't, you know, that I expect you to know what my pronouns are. Right? That's, an, that's the other expectation. Because <laughs> we've spent our whole life up to this point right now expecting to know what another person's pronouns are. And so I ex still expect that from you. Right. So <laughs> that can't offend you, but uh, you can tell me whatever you want about yourself. I, I love that. Great. Tell me all of it and I will respect it. But, but I also don't have to tell you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Maps of, uh, maps of meanings. I'm not smart enough for it yet. I hope I'm there one day. Um, I, uh, it was interesting because when I first started, yeah, you, you, Jordan's come a long way from that. Right. <laughs> and, um, but because he wrote that one really young, and I think the most impressive thing that I had about reading Maps of Meaning was, um, you know, how early in his career he writes this, you know, <laughs> huge text on, and um, uh, yeah, but he's very Jungian, you know, he's very Jungian type of um, um, psychology in that book, um, which it seems to sort of transitioning away from. But man, his common sense is un, it's remarkable. So. What do you think? Uh, what do your kids think of you? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Anna, I told Anna about the podcast when it comes out. She's going to love it. She's going to share it with everybody. Uh, my my kids go to charter school. So um, what we're talking about right now, the headmaster brings me in all the time. You know, he wants to, you know, help remove some fears of the people in the school. Uh, we were lucky we were charter. Our kids were in school the whole time, except from the spring break that it came out. The following year, back in school, and and um, everything was back to normal. And so, so Anna, Anna's going to love it, and she's at Covenant College, so she's probably going to share it with all of her uh, her friends up but, there. You know, I mean, like, do they are they following the path? That you, are they going to be professors? Are they going to be no. scientists? That's what I. Yeah. Well, uh, Anna is. Anna wants to join the uh, mission field okay. as a um, as a. Um, uh, what do you call it? Not a doula. Midwife? Midwife. She's studying midwifery. She wants, she's studying nursing and then she wants to be a midwife. So um, she's going to do the science stuff from the educational side, but she's going to be applying it. Uh, Bella, she, I think she's my Alton Brown. She is, loves to cook and she loves chemistry. So I said, well, you can be a culinary chemist, you know, they're <laughs> like Alton Brown and, uh, um, and Shirley Coye. And so um, she's on that path now. I don't know what she continued. They, they use their science and more applied. They don't want to be a, no, they don't want to sit in yeah. the lab and think. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. And my wife, we don't even have to talk about it. And I love that about her because we'll, um, you know, uh, we are very opposite. Her degree is in psychology and sociology. My degree is in chemistry. So <laughs> we actually enjoy each other's company when we go home because I don't want to talk about chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't done it for eight hours. So. My wife, if you ask her what I do for a living, she struggles to give an answer. Yeah. Like, and, and it's okay because it's like that's not, I don't know, it's just not a big deal. Like I do my thing and uh, she does her things and we enjoy each other and like each other and love the kid we created and love each other and <laughs> yeah that's i mean and um, i think i think it's helped our marriage actually because um you know we talk about the things about family how are we going to raise the kids what you know what's good what's the soccer game you know how did she do in the soccer game that's what i want to talk about and we'll talk about chemistry but. yeah <laughs> um man that's so interesting that if you made a hundred million tomorrow you'd still be a professor i would yeah i would <laughs> i love it um you know, this area is good. They have good students. Um, I work a lot with the undergraduates in the forensic program. Um, I was hired that 
for the forensic programs. So is that like when I watch forensic files, that kind of stuff? Right. So most of the instruments that we have developed, we've been developed specifically for the forensic area. So we have a, um, you can apply for a DEA uh, license over your lab and um, you have to tell them, you know, what kind of the drugs you want to bring in and what you're going to do with them and then how you store them and all that kind of stuff. And so we went through that whole process, which was lengthy, but we got it. Um, which opens a lot of doors for us. So we do. We build a lot of instruments around new drugs, new analogs, uh, methamphetamines, fentanyl. Fentanyl is our big thing right now. We do a lot of fentanyl work on the opioids because that's just a scourge. Have man. you uh, seen the documentary The Pharmacist? No. Is it good? So it's on Netflix. It's about this like seventy-year-old guy who was a pharmacist. He wasn't that old. I mean, now he's like seven. He's coming on the podcast in like a month. Um, oh, cool. And. He, his son uh, was, like, murdered in the hood when his son was, like, 16 uh, and was, like, buying drugs. And, like, I don't think he, they knew their son was on drugs or anything. And essentially the cops kept lying. And, like, he just recorded every conversation and just, like, he found the person that killed his son. <laughs> and then uh, he started to see all these, like, he just kind of made his mission to just solve things. And so he found a doctor that was open from, like, noon till 2 a.m., and had like police officers stand guard that was writing something like 3000 orders a day of, um, uh, I, I be no, what's, what's the super powerful pain medication? Fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl. Yeah. Yeah. Or oxycodone. Oxycodone. Yeah. yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, so like 3000 prescriptions a day or something. She was writing that. Like the guy who was the area sales rep, they have him on the documentary and like he quit cause he just felt so bad, but he was like, yeah, like, you know, you get her and then you don't have to like, <laughs> you, hit, you hit your numbers every month. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's really become an epidemic. And so I think, um, you know, Russia even showed us how we could weaponize it, right? They put it in the Moscow Theater when the Chechnyans came in. They had a little bit of fentanyl on the ride with the halothane that they pumped in there, and a lot of people died. So 60 people died. So we've even shown the world how we can weaponize it. It's um, it's become a real passion for me. So we spent a lot of time on fentanyl. Um, yeah, it's... it's uh it's weird that like prescription drugs get this weird pass. Like for some reason, like we have all these people dying of overdoses and I'm not of, uh, I know of fentanyl, but of, of opioids. Uh, and that's what the pharmacy really, you know, he worked at a pharmacy and would see all these people come with these prescriptions, getting opioids. And he's like, Hey, this is really powerful stuff. And you've been here a lot. And you know, like they're all addicted. Right. Um, so there's this weird thing where like drug companies, like produce opioids that are legal somehow. Like you, I can go to the counter and get one if I have like my knee hurts or whatever. <laughs> but yeah. if I want to go buy cocaine, like I'm going to go to prison for five years. And I'm not saying like cocaine should be legal, but I'm saying like if opioids are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, cocaine's still a schedule two drug because of its medicinal purposes. <laughs> right. And so it's funny because pot still stays, marijuana still stays up on schedule one. And it has medicinal purposes, so it should be down in Schedule 2 with cocaine and methamphetamine and all of those drugs, um, morphine stuff, because they are they have medicinal purposes. Oh, they're still as harmful. They don't, you know, that it's kind of a yeah, weird Yeah, you just wonder if, like, uh, Pfizer got into the marijuana business tomorrow, if it would kind of overnight become a Schedule 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or even follow even further, right? I You know, I think the federal government's had just done with marijuana because the states are all wishy-washy. You know, I, don't, I mean, it's still against the law uh, to smoke marijuana federally. Yeah. But not in Colorado or... And it's super... Uh, it's super weird. I mean, because like... Uh, I don't know. All these things are weird because it's, it's not that like... If the argument is, well, it's bad. It's like, well, yeah, so are cigarettes. So it's chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco has fiberglass in it so that it can get into your bloodstream. Do you know that? Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. That's chewing, terrible. Like, that's in a can, like the people are doing the dip thing oh, yeah. with. You know, they're not worth people like whip their can. Yeah, that has fiberglass in it so that it can cut into your bloodstream. Lovely. Um, well, I mean, and the same thing is with marijuana. I was researching that actually before I came over here was, uh, is there a pill form? Because if it's a medicinal, if... If, if you're going to use a medicinal argument for it, well, then just, just put it in pill form. 
because smoking's bad for you, right? You've been telling us. You've got these cancer warnings on everything. Putting carcinogenic material, plant material in your lungs, I mean, I know that has tar too, but that's not good for you. But, um, but you could take it as a pill, and you'd still have the same effects as Delta 9 THC. Um, but what do I know? Not a pharmacist. How do people connect with you? Can they? They can. Social media? Yeah, yeah. Guido Verbeck. It's, um, it's great. I, I like my name so much because if you can't get in touch with me, you shouldn't. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it, you know, if you, don't, if you put Guido Verbeck in, you're going to get two people. You, you might get my father also, but my great, great, great grandfather was a missionary in Japan. Died there and, uh, um, during the Meiji Dynasty changeover. And so he's actually um, buried in Japanese soil. And um, so there's a, he'll come up first, and rightly so. And then, uh, then I'll come out next. So as long as you can tell the difference between a guy in 1858 and, and me, then um, I don't have my beard on my website, so just be prepared for that. But it's a bald guy. <laughs> Do you blog and stuff? Um, I don't. I have a, a nice website, so all, a lot of the material that we put out, um, if we do shows like um, uh, Art and Metabolism and uh, some of the trips, like the trip, I took a trip to Rwanda for Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. Um, I put all of that on my website. So my, it, my website has it. It has my academic lineage on it. It's got some fun places to go if you're not a science geek. If you are a science geek, it's got a lot of fun places to go to. You can get my papers and so apparently the guy that created or found a DNA, like the guy discovered DNA, like uh, leans it to like saying like, this is like God's marking on people. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's interesting on the DNA as we, Francis Collins wrote a book called the language of God. And, um, and he now heads the national Institute of health. Um, it's interesting. It's a, program it looks to me i mean i'm not a, i actually tell my students dna and rna and genetics i run from uh, i've just never had a passion for it i like the smaller molecules but it's interesting that you have this uh, sequence of four things that and so it's often looked as like a computer program right because you have these on off you know zeros and ones all linked together and if you have all these zeros and ones and links together and you have billions of them you have a program Right? And then that program has function. Um, but it's interesting now what we're learning from genetics, like epigenetics and transposition. Um, these areas are showing that we have adaptability. So, um, you know, and so things like I move from cold weather to hot weather. I know how does my body change to adapt to that, right, to that mechanism. And, and we're starting to discover more and more that we actually have that. So I like reading that, but the books that I read on that are anecdotal, of course, because um, I hate genetics, and um, and it hates me. But uh, it's um, yeah, I agree. I agree with Francis Collins. I, it's it's amazing. I mean, it's a chicken and egg problem too. Either the protein came first, or the or DNA and RNA came first. And so that's a problem that science will have a hard time discovering. Yeah. Guido, thanks yeah. for coming in. Yeah, thank Dr. you so Guido. much. Yes, thank you.